Dear visitors of the People's Tribunal on the murder of journalists, welcome at the Sri Lanka case hearing uh, of this tribunal. We are very grateful for your presence here and online via the live stream. Um, I will just start with some quick uh, logistical notes. Um, please let the photographer know if you would not prefer to be photographed during this event. Um, and the breaks uh, and witnesses will be announced uh, from here. And we will start with welcome words by Leon Willems from Free Press Unlimited. Good morning, everyone, and uh, my due apologies and sincere apologies for the, uh, the train blockade in <laughs> between Amsterdam and The Hague. So sorry for being late. Um, uh, excellencies, judges, journalists, friends and colleagues, it's an honor to welcome you to the Sri Lanka hearing on the murder of journalists, um, La Santa Vikramatunga. Uh, it's a very special warm welcome to all of those that are listening and watching to the trial hearings in Sri Lanka itself. Uh, we are on live stream there and we know that a lot of people have been waiting to see this happening. Um, we see also that uh, the current events in Sri Lanka make this something that is being watched with uh, hope in your heart, and it's a good momentum for justice now. Amidst recent developments there, we're also watching you in Sri Lanka with hope in our hearts for positive change there. And our motto for today is, it is never too late for justice. Last December, during her acceptance speech for the Nobel Peace Prize, Filipino journalist Maria Ressa said, in order to be the good, we have to believe there is good in the world. This quote speaks to the core of what we try to achieve with the People's Tribunal on the Murder of Journalists, although impunity data remain grim and in the middle of a lot of turmoil worldwide. With old and new di dictators being elected, an ongoing war in Europe, with 16 journalists killed in this year alone, we need to collectively show that it is possible to contribute to a safer world for journalists. We can build cases by collecting evidence and hearing witnesses and relatives. We can pursue justice. Free Press Unlimited, the Committee to Protect Journalists and Reporters Without Borders, have joined forces to establish this tribunal. For this hearing, this co uh, coalition collaborated with the Center for Justice and Accountability we are grateful for their participation and proud of that collaboration. Thanks to all those that seek justice, the movement is growing. Our project also includes investigating cold cases in other countries. Um, the tribunal is a form of grassroots justice in the absence of action by the international community to achieve justice in the case of murdered journalists. With this tribunal, we also want to provide a form of justice to the families and colleagues of murdered journalists who often are not heard. To provide them with a space to share their stories and to hear them, really hear them. Trauma is added to their suffering when injustice follows the murder of their relatives or colleagues. The journalists who are killed are the journalists that are critical of government policies or people in power. They threaten that power by the stories they report. This is one of the important things that we find continuously uh, in the previous proceedings. And we've seen that during our preparation for this in the Sri Lanka hearing. The silence of witnesses too afraid to come forward, the fear of retaliation, even when people live outside of Sri Lanka, present a stark example of how devastating the repression in Sri Lanka has been. And let's hope that current events will also change that and empower people to make their voices heard for justice. Often, when the killing of a journalist, with the killing of a journalist, hope for a better future, a better functioning of rule of law, or the end of justice is also killed. As this effort as this affects us all, and it affects the world we live in, it is our collective duty to demand justice. 
We need to increase the pressure on states to implement their obligations to pr protect journalists and to investigate attacks against them. This tribunal should be a place to commemorate, but also to give new energy and inspiration to the prosecution of journalist murderers. We need to raise the cost for those killing journalists. We need a safer world for the truth. Thank you. Thank you, Leon. The next speaker is Nusheen Sarkarati. Good morning, everyone. On behalf of the family of Lasanta Wikramatunga and the Center for Justice and Accountability, I want to thank the organizers of the People's Tribunal on the murder of journalists for convening these hearings and continuing to shed light on the assassination of famed journalist Lasanta Wikramatunga. Lasanta's murder on January 8, 2009 had a profound chilling effect on the press in Sri Lanka and shocked the world. Yet despite 13 years of hard fought effort by his family and the international community calling for justice, not a single person has been held to account. I have had the honor of representing Lasanta's daughter, Ahimsa Wikramatunga, in some of her efforts to find justice for her father's murder. Like her father, she has gone through great lengths and exhibited such courage in pursuing the truth. It is unfathomable that Lasanta's family must continue to fight for justice in this way. And yet, despite the years of effort undermined by political interference and cover-ups in the investigation, the family has yet to give up hope that justice is still possible and necessary for the future of Sri Lanka. Ahimsa was unable to join us today and has asked that I read out this statement, welcoming the tribunal's proceedings on her behalf. As I speak to you today, remarkable and truly historic events are taking place in Sri Lanka. After years of suffering under the tyranny of Rajapaksa misrule and despotism, the people have risen in one strident voice and are demanding that these abusive leaders exit from government. It was under the presidency of Mahinda Rajapaksa that my father, Lasanta Wikramatunga, was assassinated in cold blood on the streets of Colombo on the 8th of January, 2009. At the time, the current president, Gotabaya Rajapaksa, served as defense secretary in his brother Mahinda's government. It was a dark and repressive era in the history of Sri Lanka, and the rulers assumed that the murder of this trailblazing journalist would be but a small distraction in the jubilant celebrations of a war victory. They could not have been more wrong. My father's assassination caused outrage, not only in Sri Lanka, but across the world. His posthumous editorial titled, And Then They Came For Me, in which he foretold his death, became an often quoted example of journalistic courage and exceptionalism, and a beacon of hope and inspiration for all those who stood for fairness, justice, accountability, and a free and robust press. Even though a murder investigation was initiated in Sri Lanka soon after his assassination, nothing came of it. When the government changed in 2015, both Sri Lanka and our family finally hoped that justice would finally be done and that Lasanta Rikwamatunga's killers would finally be held to account, but it was not to be. Members of the new government were more interested in covering for the killers than seeking to punish the perpetrators of this crime. For so many years, courts and governments have slammed the door on families of murdered journalists who seek nothing more than to bring those who killed their loved ones to justice. Now the People's Tribunal on Murdered Journalists in The Hague have taken up the case of my father, together with two other slain journalists from Syria and Mexico, Nabil Shabarji and Miguel Angel Lopez Velasco. My family and I express our deep gratitude to Free Press Unlimited, the Committee to to protect journalists and reporters without borders who collaborated to bring our family the closest we have ever come to receiving any form of closure. I am also grateful to human rights lawyer Almudena Bernabeu, all the witnesses who have come forward and everyone who has contributed in no small measure to see that this tribunal is a success. 
It is heartening that 13 long years after my father's assassination, the People's Tribunal is providing families like mine something resembling a day in court. My thoughts and prayers are with the families of murdered Sri Lankan journalists, Pragit Eknaligoda, Dharma Ratnam Sivaram, Milvaganam Nimalarajan, as well as with journalist Keith Neuer, who was subject to brutal torture, and many others who paid a high price for speaking truth to power. Perhaps when the tribunal lays out the full brutality of these murders, the bell will finally toll for those who killed journalists like my father, those who might have imagined they would never face the consequences of their barbarity. My father's assassination, just like the killings of all other journalists, was not only a heinous crime that denied his family of a wonderful father, but also robbed the people of Sri Lanka their right to the truth. In that last editorial he wrote, I hope my assassination will not be seen as a defeat of freedom, but an, but an inspiration for those who survive. I hope it will galvanize forces that will usher in a new era of human liberty in our beloved motherland. These words are indeed coming true before our eyes today as the people of Sri Lanka rise in unity against years of corruption, misrule, state-sanctioned murder, and impunity. We can dare hope that my father's vision of transparency, impartiality, tolerance, and liberty is within reach. Thank you. Thank you, Nushin. The next speaker is Jenny Tugnani, the Secretary General of the Permanent People's Tribunal. Uh, good morning to everybody. Uh, I don't think that I have to add more uh, uh, information uh, or motivation for the importance of this session, which has been uh, uh, assumed by the Permanent People's Tribunal as a key uh, question uh, in the present situation of the world, uh, what is happening these days also with respect to the journalists uh, document uh, how central is the role of those who are trying to uh, answer to the main question of these days in time of war, uh, will ever <laughs> the truth uh, be uh, the foundation for justice in the world? because it's more and more clear that uh, whatever is happening we in Ukraine, uh, in Mexico, as we have had in the first session or here, the key issue is to see whether, in fact, uh, there are conditions which could assure uh, protection, first of all, which is the first way of justice to those who are looking for uh, uh, truth to be communicated uh, to the people for whom uh, the journalists or those who represent uh, their right uh, are in fact speaking aloud. Uh, what is happening in these days again in Sri Lanka, as this was happening in Mexico when we were uh, really joining the effort in order to look for what was happening years back, and uh, it shows that uh, an attention to the past uh, is uh, the same uh, priority as to see what is happening now, because the problem, and that is, will be presented in the general presentation here, the critical issue, murders are never practically isolated events. They are indicators of processes of long term, and they are pointing to the a permanent uh, deficiency of law in guaranteeing uh, justice uh, to those who are, in fact, uh, looking for uh, the affirmation of justice. In order to do that, uh, the tribunal, as, uh, as you know, and I summarize, uh, taken the decision of adopting three model cases uh, in the world in order to document on one side how important are the different contexts in understanding, possibly explaining, certainly looking differently to the murders uh, who are apparently one event, while in fact uh, the context make them uh, different significance. And the three cases, as you know, were Mexico, 
which has been uh, dealt with uh, uh, some weeks ago. Today we have the Sri Lanka and we shall have the Syrian cases. It's up to the panel of the judges, a difficult task uh, of trying to look uh, together these things in order not to consider them separate issues. And in order to do that, the permanent uh, tribunal has uh, nominated uh, a jury, which is present here uh, uh, with uh, two persons who are uh, not here because they are they can, the, the mixed formula of being present and in virtual participation. And I will try to present here the president uh, of the tribunal is present here is Philippe Texier. Uh, with a magistrate from France, a meritorious magistrate from France with a long uh, tradition of, defend, of defense of human rights and representative not only of the national system of justice in France but also of the United Nations. Then we have the two <laughs> vice president of, of the tribunal, Ellen Jarvis from Australia, Cambodia, with a long, long, long career in representing the international body, the right uh, of people and the need for a different uh, and more effective form of justice. Then we have Nello Rossi, who is a former magistrate uh, uh, in Italy and is one of the leading director of the training of the magistrate uh, in Italy. And then we have uh, Maria Rosaria Guglielmi, who is also an Italian magistrate, who is also secretary general of an organization in Europe, which is MEDEL, and who is uh, really present where the frontiers uh, of the existing right are difficult, and is practicing concretely today also the role of magistrate. Then we have uh, uh, Kaldana Sharma from uh, India, who is a journalist and who is a person who knows also from inside what we are discussing very much and has been very active in all this area with publication and intervention. Then we have uh, uh, the, the, our colleague from uh, uh, Mexico, which is... Uh, uh, oh. Oh. Sorry. Uh, Marcella, I was rendering for the Marcella Turati, who has been very present uh, in the Mexico situation and uh, has been uh, very active as a part uh, of a movement, not only of journalists for the democracy. Then we have two persons who are not here but who are participating from uh, far from remote, uh, Marina Forti, who is uh, an Italian independent journalist who has been working also in other area of the tribunal uh, in order to investigate uh, uh, all the violation of human rights. And then Gil Beringer, who is an Australian uh, academic lawyer, but at the same time very active in the activism in the representative, not only the murders of journalists, but also of lawyer, and uh, is participating despite the difference in the time. So I think that uh, with the help of our key prosecutors, uh, Almudena, who is an independent lawyer and just, uh, we start uh, this work, uh, which uh, will be looking for uh, the case of Sri Lanka for two days uh, uh, today and tomorrow in order to collect data. As uh, you know, the tribunal is not issuing a decision immediately after that, which is also the case for other cases, but we collect evidence. Uh, the testimonies will be uh, really also requested to answer to the question of the jurors. And uh, so the day, the today and tomorrow, will be dedicated to Sri Lanka and then Monday and Tuesday will be dedicated to the Syrian case. Thank you, Jenny. The next speaker is the prosecutor of the tribunal, Amidena Bernabeu. Good morning, ladies and telecutors. Hear me? Yes? No. Okay. 
Can you hear me now? Now is the break. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It is um, a pleasure. I wanted to say, you know, hello to the the, um, the audience, uh, distinguished judges, uh, today more than the previous session. So it's a pleasure to, to share with you. And delighted and grateful one more time to be representing the interest of the journalists and their families, friends, colleagues, and I think a very concerned civil society and community about the murder of journalists. About two weeks ago, we were in Mexico, and it has been mentioned here, listening exactly what we're hoping to do today and tomorrow. Uh, friends, colleagues, facts, uh, and family members about the impact that the killing of journalists, the repression of the freedom of press and freedom of expression have in these countries. I just learned from one of our judges that since we left Mexico, three more journalists were killed, two women and a man, in two weeks. I think that there is obvious um, how relevant this effort is for all of us and for what is happening. Of course, we haven't mentioned, and I think we should, uh, just yesterday, if I believe, I another journalist from Al Jazeera was shot dead in the West Bank for doing exactly where all the colleagues that were going to be uh, representing, hopefully, in an honorable, honorable way, have been doing, which is to shed, you know, to discover the truth, investigate the truth, speak the truth, and expose whether it's corruption, organized crime, um, or frankly, pure state uh, inflicted repression, as we will see in Syria next week. As uh, echoing all the colleagues that preceded me, and be very grateful, as I said, f to the organizations that are putting this effort together, perhaps is, is my opportunity to reiterate how um, gutsy, perhaps, how brave putting this effort and how important and and, and the, the opportunity when we are seeing this to raise, to get deeper and more serious and for whatever reason, maybe the world is getting too complicated, too many things happening at the same time, but there's not enough of an international answer or an effective answer to let aside fight impunity, which is another huge focus of this effort, but to really prevent the more killing of more colleagues, journalists around the world. When we will hear, um, as it has been said, about the situation in Sri Lanka, and although Sri Lanka has made the headlines in the last couple of weeks, we will try to go back a little bit and, and introduce a Sri Lanka that has been struggling with stability and security, and journalists are facing real challenges to do their work, investigative work, since the very since since the 2000s. But to try to frame it, we will focus on the post Civil War. Sri Lanka uh, went through a very long, several decades long uh, civil war in a country deeply divided by two, you know, populations. If you a majority of uh, Sinhalese and a minority of Tamil and other minorities left uh, in this kind of polarized and hatred after the, the British ruling. That war ended in 2009 by all trends and for many of us here, a very recent war and a very recent post-war. And it provides from the perspective of, of our work, our responsibility as prosecutors, uh, the tribunal provides for an analysis that I find very important and contributing to this overall effort. We saw in Mexico, even if in appearance, what is to kill journalists and to repress freedom of information and freedom of the press in a context of, a, at least nominally, a democratic, stable country, a functioning country. We know that that is not the truth, but it was an important effort with the help of of the witnesses, of everybody who contributed, and of course the question of our uh, the panel of judges to understand what's happening in a country that can function, that is regarded as a democratic country, when journalists are being killed in such manner. And now we have a very different, um, which I find as, as, a, as a very you know challenging and important perspective. We're going to analyze the same phenomenon in a post. Uh, internal conflict society that is struggling to 
combat not only the reconstruction of the natural challenges that any society will change in a post-conflict situation, but also simultaneously and perhaps closer to what we have in Mexico and what we'll see in Syria, trying at the same time to expose that that post-conflict was going to be defined by the construction of an autocratic regime of the Raja Paxas, as we have been, been to know, Brother Mahinda and Gotabaya, that in different positions in power had decided in 2005 on to really centralize power, to really start co-opting agencies of the state, whether they were judiciary, they were obviously within the executive, to build these, well, purely corrupted or, uh, or definitely, you know, this way of, of conducting the country and, as I said, co-opting an MDVC with a couple of, um, yeah, a couple of breaks, so to speak, they being in power and securing the power since the, the end of the war. And then today we will, uh, generally speaking, we will talk about this, the, the country, we will talk about the political context, and we will be listening to professionals, national and international, with deep knowledge of the circumstances, as I mentioned in this post internal conflict um, and, and circumstances that brought Sri Lanka to the place that is today. And tomorrow we will focus, and it's already been said as well, in witness testimony, trying to narrow down an understanding as an emblematic killing, the killing of uh, journalist La Santa um, Uikrematunga, who comes to, as we focus in Mexico, and I'm a little bit of the choice of this tribunal, comes to symbolize the, the killings of many. And particularly in Sri Lanka, the Tamil community has been the one suffering uh, in, a, in an intense and disproportionate way, the attacks on, on journalists and, and otherwise. But we really thought that they, they was important to bring a case that not only is relevant by obviously the, the circumstances of, of the killing and the, the harassment and persecution that the journalist and his investigative work um, suffer. But also, and I think that there is an important second part of this tribunal, it is important, is the recurrent and rampant impunity surrendered by a case where national and international efforts, just because the opportunity was there, were put into place to seek truth and justice. And it shows how difficult that journey is for the families, for the victims, for the civil society and the countries at large when those in power uh, go through cycles, maneuvers, and other uh, tactics to remain in power or to come back to power or to somehow uh, trump any justice efforts. Uh, it is with great pleasure that we will undertake these two days of witness testimony, hoping to shed some light on the happiness in Sri Lanka at a moment, and yet again to repeat myself, so important for the Sri Lankan people as they take the streets precisely to expose and further demand changes to this status quo. Thank you very much, and we will listen now to the first witness. Thank you. I call the next witness, Dr. Pakasoti Saravanamutu, who will join us online. Good morning, everyone. And let me begin by thanking the People's Tribunal for inviting me to give testimony on this important occasion. My brief is to give you the political context of Sri Lanka, starting with the ethnic conflict to bring it up to date to the present day situation. So without much further ado, let me say that the 26-year-old ethnic conflict was brought about largely because the majority community, the singular Buddhist community, have been unwilling and unable to share power with the minority Tamil and Muslim communities. They have been unwilling to come up with a structure of governance which will sharpen and treat the minorities as equal citizens. They passed laws which discriminated against the minorities. And in particular, in 1956, you had the Singhala only, or Singhala being the language of the majority community, act by which it was made the official language of the country. 
That led to communal riots in 1956 and then again in 1958. In addition to that, any attempts by a government in power to make any political concessions to the minorities have resulted in the opposition playing the communal or ethnic card. And for years, we've had this situation when a party in power attempted to make any limited concessions to minority demands were blocked by the opposition and also taking that opposition into the streets as well. So attempts made in parliament by the political representatives of the Tamil community, as well as the predominantly singular governments failed considerably. The demand of the Tamil minority was for a federal constitution and that was rejected out of hand. In 1972, the government came up with a new constitution which made Sri Lanka a republic. Article two of that constitution makes Sri Lanka a unitary state and therefore closes the door on any kind of power sharing and federalism. Article nine went on to state that Buddhism, the religion, of the majority community will have the foremost place and that this will not be to the detriment nevertheless of other religions. So by 1972, we had constitutionally embedded a unitary state, the language of the majority community singular as the official language of the country and the religion of the majority community, Buddhism, being given the foremost place. From that point onwards, there were various incidents whereby the political representation of the minorities resisted all of this. There were bouts of communal violence, but it was only until the late 1970s that the guerrilla movement or the militant movement of the Tamil youth who in a sense were disenchanted with the previous generation's attempts in parliament to negotiate a political settlement of this dispute, took to arms and took to the street. In 1983, there was a particular incident which led to a major pogrom against Tamil citizens living in Colombo and living outside of the North and East where there is a concentration of the Tamil community. Something like over 3,000 people were burnt, killed, property ransacked, looted, all of that happened. And in effect, 1983 sort of marks the beginning of the armed conflict. On the Tamil side, there were something like 30 odd militant groups, but eventually the liberation tigers of Tamil Elam emerged after fratricidal killings, etc as the most powerful force on the Tamil side to confront the Sri Lankan army. The question has arisen as to whether the Tamils in the North and East actually supported the LTTE, but I think the answer to that question is largely one of saying that they would have ac they accepted the LTTE as defenders against the Sri Lankan army and not rulers as such. The LTT has a reputation of being a very repressive and an organization that engaged in acts of terror. Their atrocities are, make up quite a large list, which includes both the assassination of Rajiv Gandhi, the prime minister of India, as well as perpetually the assassination of President Premadasa of Sri Lanka. Now, there were various attempts at negotiations, none of which succeeded. It was largely, I think, because of two things. One, the inability, the unwillingness of the Sri Lankan government to come up with a set of pro political proposals to resolve the issue. And on the LTT side, an unwillingness to accept anything short, not just of federalism, but of confederation that would lead to a separate state. 
All of this continues until the, the mid 90s where Chandrika Bandaranaike Kumaratunga becomes the president. And she becomes a president on the platform of reconciliation and of peace building. Negotiations are started with the LTT. However, they break down and we go towards full-fledged war once again. However, the one distinguishing feature in this context of that government was that for the first time, the Sri Lankan government came up with a set of proposals political and constitutional proposals to resolve the issue. They came up with a set of proposals that dropped the reference to a unitary state. They talked about Sri Lanka being a union of regions, but that too was brought to parliament, but did not succeed because there were temporary provisions that provided for the president to continue in office and the abolition of the executive presidency to take place after she completed her term. So that constitution did not actually pass through parliament in August, 2000. The war continues and we then get Norwegian mediated brokered talks between the two sides. In November, December of 2003, the LTT for the first time also agrees and the two sides come up with a statement saying that they are willing to explore a federal solution to the conflict. However, this is a government that is made up of President Kumaratunga from one party and Prime Minister Ranil Vikramasinghe from another. Prime Minister Ranil Vikramasinghe comes into office in 2001. By 2002, he signs a ceasefire agreement with the LTT. And as I said, by 2003, we have this political proposal to explore the possibilities of a federal situation. Now, the reasons for the two coming to the table to agree to a ceasefire with a Norwegian largely Norwegian brokered uh, monitoring mission was that the LTT believed that they had earned themselves a place at the negotiating table and that the new government of Sri Lanka wanted to get the war out of the way so that it could pursue development in the South. The LTT assumed that the North and East of the country was being given to them on a platter. They proceeded to engage in a number of human rights violations, which brought that ceasefire into tremendous disrepute as far as the rest of the country was concerned. So by 2005, the war is really continuing. The ceasefire is really being broken. And in 2005, we have a presidential election between Mahinda Rajapaksa and Ranil Vikramasinghe. Now, in that presidential election, Ranil Vikramasinghe is seen as the peace candidate. But as far as elements in the Singhala South are concerned, he's also seen as pro-Tamil, pro-minority, pro-Western. Whereas Mahinda Rajapaksa is seen as the true candidate of the Singhala Buddhist majority. Rajapaksa wins because the LTT declares in the North that there should be a boycott of the presidential election. I think there's a general consensus that if the Tamils were allowed to vote in the North, that Ranil Vikramasinghe would have won the election. But the boycott was enforced and pretty brutally in some instances, and Mahinda Rajapaksa emerges as the winner. The rationale of the LTT and the Tamil nationalists was that this should be an election where the Singhala South decides who the president of the country should be, so that the rest of the world would realize the justice of their cause, because the Singhala South would never agree to a just political settlement of the conflict. The Rajapaksa regime, though, continues with talks until 2006, 
when the LTT blocked the flow of water in the eastern province, the Marvil Aru Anikat was closed by them, resulting in, again, open warfare between the two. Now, the Rajapaksa regime was very much of a singular nationalist regime who then vowed to end the war. And I must say that they engaged in negotiations, but the LTT persisted in provoking them to come out and show what the LTT and the Tamil nationalists believed were their true colors. Mahindra Rajapaksa appointed his brother, Gotabe Rajapaksa, as the defense secretary. Gotabe Rajapaksa had served in the Sri Lankan army, but had resigned and he was in the States. He was brought back and made the defense secretary. The Rajapaksa regime in general was seen as a very nationalist, chauvinist, and a regime that was showing a lot of signs of authoritarianism with regard to any kind of dissent. And particularly dissent in terms of their perpetrated human rights violations, their attacks on the freedom of speech and assembly, and on journalists in particular. In January 2008, they torched the offices of one of the leading dissenting broadcasting corporations. And then we also had the murder of La Santa Vikramatunga. The Rajapaksas decided that they would spare nothing in the pursuit of military victory against the LTTE. We are told that the previous government of Chandrika Kumaratunga was also told that, you know, the war could be finished, but it would take X number of combatants on the government side, and it would result in X number of casualties on the civilian side. We are told that she refused to accept those costs, and therefore the war continued in terms of skirmishes, battles, etc. But now the Rajapaksas decided to increase the number of armed forces, engage in major militarization in terms of rearmament, and we have a war that was fought until May 2009, where a victory was secured, a military victory was secured against the LTTE. Now, the point that needs to be made was that Gotabe Rajpaksa, as the defense secretary, had the full power and authority of his brother. He could do whatever he liked and whatever he wished, both in terms of the conduct of the war and in terms of the suppression of dissent against the war and the other human rights atrocities of the Rajapaksa regime. But once the war was won, they became the great heroes of the majority community. And Gotabe Rajapaksa too was seen as one of the leading architects of that victory. But that victory, although it was celebrated with great fanfare in the South, also was marked by human rights violations, which by now are well known. The killing of Prabhakaran, the LTT leader's son, the broadcaster, the fact that a number of people surrendered or gave themselves up to the Sri Lankan armed forces and have not been seen since. The continued use of the Prevention of Terrorism Act, the disappearances increased considerably and as a consequence of all of that, the government came into disrepute to the extent that by 2012, we have the resolutions in the Human Rights Council in Geneva on Sri Lanka, calling on the government to fulfill on its pledges to look into instances 
of alleged war crimes and crimes against humanity, to come up with a political settlement, to come up with the process of transitional justice. That has continued in Geneva to the extent that now there is a unit in the office of the High Commissioner collecting information on war crimes and crimes against humanity. Rajapaksa wins a landslide in the 2010 election and then proceeds to institutionalize his platform of singular Buddhist hegemony. In the North and East, despite the promises of a political settlement, what we have is a large concentration of the armed forces, camps of the armed forces, armed forces setting, building temples and uh, setting up camps, armed forces taking land from innocent civilians, armed forces engaging in from private trade to growing agricultural produce to selling it to owning restaurants, to golf courses, and all of that. So they created the perception of being an army in occupation. Civil society in the North and East felt extremely subjugated and repressed. And even to this day, you have members of the Terrorism Investigation Department, the TID, the Criminal Investigation Department, Army Intelligence, constantly visiting them, asking them what they are doing, where do they get their funds from, why they are doing X, Y, and Z. So there is a sense of repression and closing of space as far as the North and East is concerned. The promises that were made, and this was to the UN Secretary General as well as others internationally, to proceed with the process of transitional justice were never met. And the Rajpaksa regime was also accused of rampant corruption, and as a consequence of which, at the 2015 presidential election, where Rajapaksa, Mahinda Rajapaksa, attempted to run for an unprecedented third term, he was defeated by a member of his own party running as a joint opposition candidate, Michael Pala Sirisen. That government in 2015 won on a platform of promising accountability. In the South, it was with regard to the corruption, rampant corruption of the Rajapaksa regime. And in the North, it was largely accountability for war crimes and allegations of crimes against humanity. However, it was a joint opposition government. It was a government therefore made up of two parties who had been historic political rivals. And given the personalities of the president and the prime minister, there were bound to be problems in decision-making. And indeed there were serious problems. And a consequence of that, the government came to be seen as weak and indecisive. But more damaging was that whilst they launched investigations into the Rajapaksas, they didn't actually indict or convict anyone. And therefore that gave rise to the perception that the political class in the country were complicit, irrespective of partisan allegiance. In addition to that, this government decided that it would accept the burden or the responsibility of engaging in a process of transitional justice. And the foreign minister promised four mechanisms to deal with transitional justice at the UN in Geneva an Office of Missing Persons, an Office of Reparations, a Truth and Justice Commission, as well as an accountability mechanism, which would involve the proactive participation of international judges and prosecutors. However, they came back 
and they set up a consultative task force to find out what people thought about all of this. The task force too recommended that there should be an accountability mechanism with the proactive involvement of foreign judges and prosecutors. The government took up the position, as did the Rajapaksa opposition, that Sri Lanka's war heroes would not be turned into war criminals. And because of the accountability mechanism, the whole process of transitional justice, notwithstanding the establishment of an office of missing persons and an office of reparations, was put on the back burner. But what really created the crisis was the bombings, the atrocities by Muslim extremists on churches and hotels in Colombo in 2019, resulting in the loss of over 250 Sri Lankan citizens. Now this built up on two things. One was that there is evidence that the government was warned about this and did nothing. And therefore that lends a certain amount of credence to the arguments that there was a political conspiracy which resulted in this atrocity. And secondly, it built up on the Rajapaksa's attacks, not now on the Tamil community, but on the remaining minority community in the country, the Muslim community. As a consequence, and as a consequence of COVID too, there have been a number of actions that have been taken against the Muslim community, which are openly discriminatory. There have been attacks during the first Mahindra Rajapaksa regime, and then subsequently on Muslim businesses. There have been Gobelsian type propaganda against the Muslim community. During COVID, there was a ban on burial, despite all expert medical evidence saying that burial was not in any way endangering people's lives. And we have continued with this sort of othering of the Muslim community as well. So as a consequence of the weakness and the vacillation of the government that came into power in 2015, the Rajapaksas formed a new party and they formed a network of, for their campaign of temples to win the 2019 presidential election with Gotabe Rajapaksa as the candidate. So in effect, Gotabe Rajapaksa wins that election with 6.9 million votes. It's a platform based on the politics of hate and hurt and harm. It is about singular nationalism. It's a platform that gains its legitimacy from those in robes as well as those in uniform. In addition to that, when he got into office, one of the first things that he did was he cut taxes, which has lost the treasury millions and is a direct contributory factor to the current economic crisis. Now, Gotabe Rajpaksa has never been a politician. His only experience, if you like, of governance was probably commanding a platoon in the Sri Lankan army. And as a consequence, he has not been sensitive to what politics requires in terms of government and governance. He brought in a lot of ex-army people into government and as a consequence has institutionalized the role of the army in government. He has also said that he was bringing in experts from an organization called Vyat Magar. Mm -hmm. But these experts who have been brought
tax base. There was also the announcement that Sri Lanka would move to organic fertilizer for agriculture, that we would move overnight. And as a consequence, it has created serious disruption in the food supplies. So here is a man who presents himself as a strong leader, but now has taken about two months to actually address the country in the throes of the worst crisis of governance and the worst economic crisis that has hit the country. Yes, I can. With the speak with, okay, now I'm back on. Okay, it was a problem with the um, with the microphones here in the room that we're sitting. So could I ask okay. you just to, you don't have to repeat it, obviously literally, but if you could just please go back a little bit. Yeah, so Gotabe Rajpaksa presents himself as a strong, decisive leader, but he has only spoken to the country in the current worst crisis of governance and the worst economic crisis the country has ever faced only yesterday. He has flipped and flopped in terms of his decision-making in the course of his crisis. What is the crisis at the present moment? The crisis has many facets. The Rajapaksas have come to be identified with human rights violations, allegations of war crimes and crimes against humanity. Mm. There are governments that have put travel bans on leading members of the Rajapaksa regime. <coughs> if they leave power, they will be extremely vulnerable to prosecution, to international jurisdiction, to prosecution. The shield of impunity that they have used will go. So they are fighting for their political survival, literally and metaphorically speaking. They have not created the economic crisis, but they have come to personify it because of the misdeeds, the rampant corruption, the insensitivity and arrogance that they have displayed and the lack of capacity to understand basic economic issues. So today the country is on its knees. We have an exchange rate where when they came into power, when Gotabe Rajpaksa came into power, it was 180 rupees to the dollar. And now it is almost 400 rupees to the dollar. We have no foreign exchange reserves. We insisted on using our foreign exchange reserves to pay back our creditors. And as a consequence, we didn't have any foreign exchange reserves to buy basic essentials from fuel to food. Colombo and the rest of the country are littered with queues for all of these things. The situation with regard to medicine is particularly acute. Now, as a consequence of this, People came out, spontaneously they came out and demanded that the Rajapaksas go. They demanded that President Rajapaksa resign, that the rest of his family also leave politics and that they bring back the alleged national wealth that they have stolen. As a consequence of this outpouring, and these were thousands of people at Golface Green in the middle, in the heart of Colombo. These were predominantly youth, but not exclusively. They were drawn from all ethnicities. They were drawn from all religions and all classes. And they have made this one persistent demand that still stands, that Rajapaksa should go. He shuffled cabinets. And on Monday, his brother, the Prime Minister, Mahindra Rajapaksa, eventually resigned. But before he resigned, 
he called a meeting of all his supporters, thousands of them, to Temple Trees, the official residence of the Prime Minister. They made inflammatory speeches. It was a situation somewhat similar to Donald Trump and the attack on the Capitol building in the Washington DC. His supporters marched on Goldface and attacked unarmed, innocent protesters, burnt down the tents that they had built and whatever they had put up. However, public sentiment quickly switched and violence was then visited upon a number of Rajapaksa supporters. There were eight deaths, including one of a member of parliament from the ruling coalition. There, was how, there were houses and property of leading Rajapaksa supporters burnt. As a consequence, we had a curfew imposed. Earlier on, he introduced emergency rule. Now, sorry. Just, we don't know if you were done or not. Sorry. No. Now we have a situation in which Sri Lanka has no government. There's only the president in office. He has to find a prime minister who will take on the role and set up a new cabinet. We are supposed to be having negotiations with the IMF, but those are stalled because there isn't a government to deal with. Yesterday, he promised that he would appoint a new prime minister and that he would reintroduce the 19th Amendment of the previous government, which introduces checks and balances on the exercise of the executive presidency, and that he would allow them to eventually move towards the abolition of the executive presidency. The opposition's argument is, is that they will not join any cabinet which has a Rajapaksa or any cabinet which has Gotabe Rajapaksa as the president of the country. So as a consequence of their greed, as a consequence of their insensitivity and arrogance, as a consequence of their lack of capacity to understand basic economics and their total denial of human rights and their tremendous involvement in the violations of human rights, the Rajapaksas have brought this country to its knees. We cannot resolve this question without seeing them out of politics. And that is, in effect, the stalemate or deadlock that we have. We can't get out of the economic crisis unless he goes. We can't resolve the political crisis unless he goes. We can't begin to establish serious structures and processes and institutions of governance until they're out of politics. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Bakasotti. I have a two-pronged question. This is Almudian Arnabeu speaking in the prosecution. Um, we talked about, um, well, there's a number, a, an official number of 44, go bring it back to the, the, the sector, the journalists, the, the repression of dissidents and freedom of, of press and speech. We talk about, I mean, there's a number of 44 journalists killed in Sri Lanka since 2000. And it's a two-prong, because I wanted to, if you could, walk us a little bit through that, uh, perhaps, decade as of today, and when, in different moments, what was the situation of journalists, and if it increased or decreased, or it became more uh, dangerous at times? I mean, what the situation was, was constant, or to some extent, um, would differ from different periods? And then also the second part of the question is, what's the situation of the press today? From 2019, since the Rayapaksas managed to get back to power and in the current, uh, around the current events. Thank you very much. Well, the situation of the of the media and the situation with regard to freedom of 
expression was particularly bad during the Rajapaksa years, that is from 2005 to 2015, and now from 2019 onwards. The situation today has been considerably changed because of social media. Social media has opened up a space for dissent. And indeed, even during the latter years of Mahindra Rajapaksa's presidency, dissent moved from print and electronic media largely to the net. Yeah. So what we have was therefore a situation in which any criticism of the armed forces, any criticism of the government in terms of conducting the war and in the post-war phase was seen as subversive. And therefore, those who practice it were either beaten up, abducted, or killed. Now, because of social media, it's a lot, lot more difficult to control that. And it is indeed surprising that Gotabe Rajpaksa, who comes in with 6.9 million votes in 2019, mm -hmm. by January, February 2021, has a lot of criticism even caricature on social media. And that this notion that, you know, he was a person who was behind the white vans by which people were abducted and that he was to be feared, that seems to have gone completely. And now the situation is much more freer. We also have a right to information regime installed because the legislation was passed by the previous government. So the situation from 2005 to basically 2015 was one of repression. Thank you very much. I don't have any more questions. I don't know if the panel of judges may have some questions. Yeah, good morning. Um, uh, my name is Kalpana Sharma from India. So what I'm trying to understand is you're saying now that, uh, that the digital space has opened up um, for dissent. But does this mean that in Sri Lanka, they're not monitoring journalists who are writing for these digital platforms? I'm asking you this because in India, even though it's opened up, there, is, there are laws now. And anybody posting even on Facebook, any kind of dissent can be picked up. So are you saying that in Sri Lanka, at least for the moment, that space is there and journalists who are writing for digital news platforms, for instance, uh, are not under scrutiny and are not under danger of being picked up if they are uh, writing critically about the government? Well, they are monitoring. They definitely are monitoring. There is surveillance. But they haven't succeeded in suppressing or getting rid of the wealth of criticism and dissent that one can find on social media. Because, you know, in addition to the bona fide journalists, we have the notion of citizens journalism, where ordinary citizens are reporting on what's happening in the country and are providing their opinion in this digital space. So whilst they are monitoring, it's not that easy to shut them down. May I ask a question? Sure. Uh, thank you. Thank you for uh, your uh, very clear and uh, wide, um, uh, the framework of the situation you expose it. Uh, I would like to ask you, uh, beside the journalists and beside the cases we are going to take up in this tribunal, uh, what about the civil, the civil society? Were there voices in the civil society, either human rights 
defenders or um, social activism or labor activism or any kind of social um, uh, activism or uh, organization in the civil in the civil society uh, were there any voices to question this uh, as you describe it this nationalist the chauvinist regime oh yes oh yes there have been civil society activists there have been trade unions uh, who have come out and spoken and as a consequence we've received death threats we've had on state-owned media campaigns of character assassination. Some of us have been detained. Some of us have been disappeared. All of that has happened. I mean, I myself have had death threats. I myself have been questioned. So yes, all of that has been done. But that has not stopped us from speaking truth to power, I suppose. Thank you. I do have a follow-up question, if that's all right. To your last answer, could you describe what is the situation? I understand the social media playing a, a peculiar role in making it more widespread, perhaps the dissenting and the criticism, and in a way shields traditional outlets. But the attacks and the harassment to those more traditional outlets and journalists and investigative professionals remain have increased, if you have um, information about that? Well, I mean, they have increased insofar as they, whenever emergency is declared, they come up with uh, various ways in which people have to be a lot more careful and considered in what they report. Yeah. There are certain journalists who have felt the greater brunt of interrogation, of surveillance, and where their personal property has also been attacked. Yeah. So that situation has continued, but I guess it's been halted now because of the protests. And I don't think it can continue unless the protests are smothered by army intervention or, you know, basic authoritarian practices of the regime with the collusion of the military and the security forces. But yes, journalists, both print and broadcast journalists, are under continuous surveillance. And if they step out of line, they are brought back into line by threats, by interrogation, all of that. Thank you very much. I don't have any more questions. Sorry, I have one more question, which is um, with regard to Tamil journalists. Yeah. So I want to know whether, I mean, post-war, and particularly in the period you're referring to um, up to 2015, and perhaps even to the present day, uh, what is their situation? Because that would still be very specific to what is happening post-war in the North and the East. And maybe not enough is being talked about uh, their situation. And uh, it would be good for us to just in terms of a perspective to understand, uh, you know, independent uh, publications as well as digital news platforms coming out of the North and the East. Are they under particularly uh, a greater surveillance because they're of their location? Uh, how, how, how has all this affected them? Thank you. In general, the North and East and all activism, journalism, all of that, the situation has been worse. But at the same time, it's probably underreported. Thirdly, when we have lobbied in Geneva at the Human Rights Council, etc., we lobby on the basis of information that is given to us from the ground in the North and East. And so I think the government has come to recognize that these people are providing information that is becoming international. 
gap. So in general, the situation is a lot worse across the board as, as far as the North and East is concerned in comparison with the rest of the country. Uh, I have uh, a question, if I may. Uh, thank you for your uh, very comprehensive uh, introduction for us. Um, I was interested in your um, statement that the uh, current um, mass movement in uh, in Colombo uh, is covering, as you said, all all ethnicities, all religions, and all classes. And I was wondering if you could just expand on that a little bit. In particular, has there been a, a, any under, uh, understanding or any uh, revelation of an understanding of the need for uh, Tamil um, demands to be met uh, among the uh, Sinhala uh, protesters? Uh, I'm interested in what has seemed to happen in Myanmar where the current um, uh, movement has indicated uh, a much more um, progressive view towards Rohingya and Muslim minorities than previously had been the case in the Burma community. And I'm wondering if we see any indications along those lines. And the uh, second part of my question is, um, what is happening outside Colombo? We see what's happening at Goldface, but uh, is there any uh, movement in other in other cities and also in particular in the north as well? Thank you. Yes, the protests are island wide. Absolutely, the protests are island wide. Colombo is probably the largest single concentration of protesters, but they are island wide. In the North and East, there is probably less enthusiasm in terms of the numbers of demonstrators and all of that, largely because they have gone through this for 26 or 30 years of civil war. Secondly, there is also an element of, yeah, now the singular people are suffering, but we were suffering for 30 odd years, and where were you? Thirdly, there's also the question that people get remittances from relations outside. And with the exchange rate, they're not doing too badly as a consequence. Yeah. So with regard to the North and East, they are used to this hardship. But nevertheless, they have come out in protest as well. As far as the question of a political settlement of the ethnic conflict is concerned, yes. It is there when they talk about constitutional reform, when they talk about political reform, it is there. But it's not at the forefront of the protesters. At the forefront is the demand for the Rajapaksas to leave and the demand with regard to their financial corruption. Thank you very much. I think we, I think we finished with that question. Thank you again. Thank you. If all, at the end of questions, I, I would like to make a, a brief statement. So, but is, are there any more questions uh, from judges who are not with us in person? Um, just one moment. Yes, I wanted to make a statement, a brief statement. Thank you very much. This is uh, this statement is not addressed to the, this particular witness, uh, but a general statement uh, on behalf of of the judges. Uh, in opening the sessions uh, that were held uh, uh, in uh, uh, that will be held in these uh, coming days today, the, today, tomorrow on Sri Lanka and next week, we wanted to emphasise that. Uh, while it's our consideration is focused on the three extreme cases, Mexico, Sri Lanka, and Syria, of bloody repression of, of press freedom, 
We also extend our concern to other notorious situations of violence against journalists in other parts of the world. And in particular, the tribunal is moved to pay tribute to Shirin Abu Akleh, an Al Jazeera journalist who was murdered on Wednesday morning during clashes in the Jenin refugee camp while doing her job. Since has often been the case in the past, both sides in the conflict blame their adversaries for her death. But the tribunal calls on the UN and others to promote the establishment of an independent and impartial uh, commission of inquiry that can travel to the sites of the clashes and contribute to the ascertaining the truth. We also take this opportunity to refer and pay tribute to the uh, three journalists in Mexico who have been killed since our hearings there a mere two weeks ago. Uh, uh, Luis Enrique Rivera, Yesenia Molinedo Falconi, and Sheila Johanna Garcia Oliveira. We paid tribute to those who have fallen in the exercise of their profession. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sara Vanutu, for your testimony. And we will now resume with a break and continue with the next testimony in 30 minutes. Thank you.
we're waiting for the live stream to start. <laughs> Welcome back at the Sri Lanka case hearing of the People's Tribunal on the murder of journalists. We will st first start with the introduction of the last judge, Mr. Eduardo Bertoni, and afterwards we will resume with the next witness testimony of Mr. Bashana Abai Wardana. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I apologize myself, but KLM canceled my flight. I supposedly have to be here yesterday, and I just arrived from the airport. So I'm very happy to be here with my colleagues, and I'm not going to talk more. Thank you. Good morning and welcome, uh, Mr. Abe Guardane. Uh, I, the way we're going to do this, and just to give you a little bit of a an idea is that I will ask you a very open initial question and we would love to listen uh, to you. And then the, I may have some follow-up questions if that is okay to clarify some important points and objectives of this, of this tribunal naturally. And then the judges will have some time for questions. Uh, so without any further delay, if you could please introduce yourself to the panel and the audience in in that, include a uh, description, please, of the work and mission of the Journalists for Democracy in Sri Lanka. Uh, good morning, uh, honorable members of the panel. Uh, I will uh, first read a small kind of a note that I have prepared. Uh, good morning to all of you. And I would take this opportunity first to thank the organizers of this event, the Free Press Unlimited, uh, uh, the Reporters Without Borders, and the Committee to Protect Journalists uh, for taking Sri Lanka as one of the countries that needs to be investigated for the crimes committed against journalists. And my name is Bashan Abhevadhan, and I am here as the coordinator of the Journalists for Democracy in Sri Lanka, an organization widely known as JDS. Uh, we are an exile group of journalists, writers, and human rights defenders who were forced into exile within the last 15 years. Uh, as I'm testifying before you, Sri Lanka, where I was born, is burning. As mass anger rages across the island, tens of thousands of people have taken to the streets as a response to an unprecedented economic crisis and repressive measures. The shortage of food and medicine have been the most pressing issues. The military is manning the roads as personal armed carriers roll through the streets of Colombo, just like it has always been for the Tamil people living in the island, at least for the last 60 to 70 years, who have been forced to live under the military boot of the ethnocratic state. As I speak on behalf of the organization which I have been working for the last 13 years, I think of every man and every woman who have raised their voices facing the wrath of the repressive government that rules the land I was born. The courage, the resilience, the dedication showed by the people in thousands bring me hope and strength to stand here and speak about the bloodstained history of my birthland. And let me explain about myself a bit, honorable members of the panel. Uh, I'm a Sinhalese by ethnicity and I'm a journalist by profession. I entered journalism in December 1991, soon after leaving my high school, and started working as a trainee journalist in one of the mainstream single weekly newspapers published in Colombo. Uh, my career started in the context of massive repression that witnessed state brutality unleashed on my generation, who stood against the endless repression of an unpopular government. 
over 60,000 young men and women in the south of the island were slaughtered and burnt on the roads, including my teenage friends. Mr. Bashan, I apologize for the interruption, but the judges are signaling me that they need uh, something. Would you mind? So hold on one second. Yeah. No Spanish, yeah. There's no Spanish translation. Okay, they cannot reinstate it. Should we wait or should we? Can we continue? I'm so sorry, please yeah, continue. Uh, over 60,000 young men and women in the south of the island were slaughtered and burned on the roads, including my teenage friends and relatives and many other known people. My journalist career started one year after the killing of leading journalist Richard de Souza, who was working for Interpress Service at the time of his abduction and assassination by state-organized death squads. Uh, even at the time, journalism was a career that earned all the risks and dangers if he or she wanted to speak the truth. In 1993, I, along with my all my colleagues in the editorial of the newspaper we worked, resigned in protest of the intervention made by the owners of the newspaper company who wanted to dictate what we write. The same year, we started a weekly newspaper on our own after a four month long intense public fundraising campaign. It was a newspaper owned by journalists and managed by journalists. Apart from my editorial contributions made as a sub editor, and much later as the editor of the paper, I regularly contributed to other newspapers and periodicals until the moment I fled into self-exile at the end of year 2006. The articles and regular columns I have been writing mainly involved matters related to the war and human rights violations, especially after the renewed hostilities between the government and the Liberation Tigers of Tamil Elam. But the killing of Lasanta changed the landscape for the journalists in the South. But for the Tamil journalists who are doing their job in the North and the East, it has always been a nightmare, which I will elaborate later uh, as a response to the questions. This is basically a brief introduction about myself and my profession. Thank you. Um, and I think you touch on what it will be my next question. And it is, I mean, it's, it's the, the circumstances of having to do the journalistic war, uh, work throughout a war. So I just wanted to see if you can describe a little bit, and then it has been clear from the prior testimony that the situation in the North and the Northeast was very different than the South. How that was lived by a journalist, and what were the situation to, to your knowledge of the Tamil, or the, or the persecution of Tamil journalists in particular? Yeah, uh, actually, uh, uh, let me uh, quote apart from the statement I have already made, which deals with the, the question directly. The period uh, started from April 2004 opened the doors for an entire different period of terror. It all started by the killing of a Tamil journalist from the eastern part of the island, Mr. Ayatudin Adesan, who was shot to death in May 2004. Since then, until the disappearance of Prageet Neknaliwada, whose wife, Sandhya, is also here, and I take it as a kind of It's an emotional moment for me because it's the first time I met uh, Sandhya. And uh, to see her like this, uh, it makes me really sad. And also, I, uh, she brings quite a lot of strength uh, to most of the people in Sri Lanka who are on the streets now. And until the disappearance of Prageet Technaligur in January 2010, at least 44 journalists and media workers have been killed or disappeared. And to response, I mean, as a response to your question, let me tell, um, tell, let me take a breakdown of these numbers. And out of these 44, at least 38 journalists and media workers were either killed or made to disappear by the Sri Lankan government. And out of that 38, 35 remain ethnic Tamils, which shows the ethnic dimension of the state perpetrated crimes against media. And having quoted the numbers, it clearly explains the crimes against uh, journalists that have been committed for the last 10, 15, or 20 years cannot be separated from the crimes committed against the Tamil people in the country. And if a Sinhalese journalist was targeted, 
and killed or abducted, that has always to do something with this position or her position towards the Tamil question and the war. So there's a underlying, uh, underlying uh, real, um, underlying truth about the uh, persecution against journalists in the country, as always to do something with their positions they take towards the rights of the Tamil people and now the rights of the Muslim people as well. And in your opinion and through your knowledge, how does such repression uh, has changed or affected the, the, the job of the journalist itself, whether it's investigation or the way they are reporting about things? Well, I think uh, one of the main things in a country like Sri Lanka where a repressive government governs, uh, what they do as a first uh, step is to close the democratic space where the free press existing or functioning. And by doing so, they basically redesign and reformulate the rules of engagement. And the journalists are given a choice either to play by the rules and live or violate the rules and die. So these are the two options that is always uh, uh, existing in the country for the last 15, 20 years, even more than that actually. So uh, the problem is actually when uh, journalists are given to deal with certain issues, they will, be, they will have liberty to deal with certain issues. But there are systemic issues, structural issues that they can't speak about. And the best example is the last 15 years one of the dominating kind of topics that dominated about Sri Lanka was the war crimes that was committed by the Sri Lankan state. But you can't find many articles in the Sri Lankan press about these crimes, because that is where they have drawn the rule. And they have drawn the line, basically, making sure that the journalists can deal with petty corruption and other, uh, mis I mean, like, uh, uh, other problems of the government, other problems of the government, but as long as they don't touch the structure, uh, structural issues, which is actually the criminality of the state, they can function. So in the current situation, still the journalists are not able to discuss the crimes committed against the Tamil people and the crimes being committed against the Muslims because it, dis it involves not simply the government but the state itself, and which has been the case uh, for the JDS, the reason that a regime change, a simple regime change would not allow us to go back is because everything that we did so far is being identified as uh, work against the state. So more than anti rajapaksha or anti-government, we have been seen as anti-state. And therefore, our ability to work as journalists inside the country is still decisively curtailed. In, in your opinion, this self-censorship, it's encouraged by uh, big media outlets, by the journalists. Is it something that one applies to itself, or this is really something encouraging all the different outlets and, and newspapers and the like? Uh, it's a complicated, uh, I have a complicated answer. Actually, la I mean, the thing is, there's a large kind of uh, willingness among the journalists to go with the official narrative when it comes to state crimes, as long as the victims are non sinhalese And if the victims are Sinhalese, it's a different matter, who are from the ethnic, the majority ethnic community. So the journalists, the, the small minority of journalists who want to deal with such issues, take, I mean, do that, taking enormous risks. Uh, so I would say the reason that these issues not being dealt in the mainstream media is largely because there's no will. There's a clear lack of will to in, uh, uh, challenge the official narrative and the triumphalist uh, narrative of the war victory. And if somebody is uh, willing to challenge it, he or she would definitely know what the what price come with it actually. So the, the, what you see, the absence of these issues on media was largely decided more than by the owners, by the journalists themselves actually. How I understand that you've been doing, despite of these um, that these threats, and you are an investigative journalist and you are from the Sinhalese majority, how do you conduct uh, this currently, uh, under the current circumstances, this work, or even in, in the last few months? 
Uh, one thing is actually since, I mean, the JDS is, uh, there are Sinhala journalists as well as Tamil journalists. And if you compare the numbers of uh, journalists who were forced into exile, uh, the number of Sinhala journalists are actually less than the number of Tamil journalists. But the ability for the Tamil journalists to continue their work due to various issues is quite limited. So the active journalists who are working, Tamil journalists who are working with the JDS at the moment, uh, are uh, trying to bring out the information from the Tamil society. But when it comes to the last couple of months, the fact that we are coming from the majority community still gives us, gives us a kind of a, uh, advantage of getting information from the ground. And for example, the, uh, one of the best uh, instances was the fact that we were able to bring out all these war crime evidence because the JDS was instrumental in bringing out the very first video evidence of the war crimes that was committed by the state armed forces against the Tamil people in the final stages of the war. And this is because this came from the military. And the military is 99% are from the, uh, made out of the Sinhalese. And they are connected to the larger society of the Sinhalese. And therefore, it's always we have avenues uh, to get such evidence because uh, our contacts on the ground are quite intact and they come from the single society who managed to get this uh, information and to pass it, uh, pass it on to us basically because there's no way they could expose these crimes or expose the events that are happening on the ground uh, in the way that we can do because we have a more kind of uh, free environment to do that without fearing the repercussions. And having said that, I would like to point out one thing. Even when it comes to working in exile, it's not a kind of always uh, a safe kind of uh, job. Because uh, I remember my, from my personal experience in 2009, uh, I was, I, I'm living in Berlin, and I got a letter from the German police uh, telling that there has been a complaint made against me uh, that I have entered a certain premises, a private premises in Berlin, and tried to uh, damage the property. So I was quite uh, puzzled, and I was not even a refugee at the time. I was uh, staying in Germany with a scholarship from the German pen. And when I checked the address of the letter that I got, I realized actually the address belongs to Sri Lankan embassy in Berlin. And the letter I got in June 2009, but the incident the letter refers to has happened in February 2009. So I had to inform the pen who were hosting me and tell them that I have got a letter from the police asking me to present myself uh, at the Berlin police headquarters. And fortunately, they got involved. And finally, actually, when we uh, double check, I mean, like the uh, uh, compare the dates, we realized actually on that particular day, exactly at that time, we were with the pen having dinner in some place in uh, Berlin. And as a result of it, the police uh, and the lawyer got involved and he asked me not to come to the police and he will deal with it. And that was a false complaint made to the German police. That is even one month before the Journalists for Democracy in Sri Lanka was founded. So that is how the government is dealing with, even with the people who are actually think, we think that we are safe because are out of, this, out of the country. But if they really need to deal with this kind of uh, situation, they would do, they would go an extra mile to deal with people like uh, us and it proves. Will you say that they, are they more worried qualitatively of journalists reporting about the commission of war crimes and crimes against humanity, that they are about corruption, or they will just not like to be exposed uh, in any way? Well, I think uh, the journalists who are reporting or collecting information on war crimes and uh, crimes against humanity that happened during the war, uh, they can't actually uh, expose any of those information using the Sri Lankan media, I mean, like the newspapers or the, any other electronic medias, because uh, that is that exists, that topic exists beyond the limits of media freedom. And if they want to deal with that, it comes with a price, just like uh, it uh, happened to many others, like even Lasantha. And if you uh, allow me, I would like to point out a couple of things about Lasantha's killing, because Lasantha's killing uh, has a direct connection to the government's war effort. Because Lasante exposed massive corruption behind uh, the much uh, celebrated uh, war victories that was being uh, part of the government's success at the time. And it had, it had a direct connection. And before he was killed, 
everybody knows about Lasantes editorial that was I mean that was published posthumously uh, about when they uh, then they came for me, but before that, he wrote a editorial which has not been highlighted enough. Actually, five days before he was killed, that was his last editorial he wrote while he was still living uh, and uh, working as the editor of the paper. And let me let me. Uh, quickly quote his words. This is what he wrote. Now, he exposed massive corruption, as I said, but a week before he was killed, coinciding with the capture of Tamil rebel held administrative capital, Kilinochi, by the government forces, he wrote an editorial titled, A Nation's Last Hurrah. That was the only single editorial published in any of the single or English newspapers in that week, had courage to challenge the triumphalist narrative put forward by the government. And let me quote his own words. I'll quote two paragraphs. This is what he wrote. No one doubts that with an investment of nearly 200 billion Sri Lankan rupees per year and the willingness to exp expend a few thousand lives and limbs, the government can, in the course of 2009, credibly claim to have won not just Kilinochi, but all of the North. Now, he wrote this in 4th of January, 2009. The 200 billion rupees we plan to spend on bombing the life out of the LTT's remaining 4,000 carders, after all, should do the job. As for the lives, there's still plenty of space left on those stones, tablets, on the doormat of the parliament for them. And as for limbs, where would Jaipur be if not for the steady stream of feet shipped to help keep the armed forces on the, <coughs> on the hop? Granted that after winning the war, just as in, is the case in the east, the north too will be converted into an occupied territory. A matrix of army camps will dot the landscape, help to keep errant Tamils from getting any funny ideas, and the lion flags will flutter briskly in the Kachan winds of the Vanni. It will not be the meek but Douglas Devananda who will inherit the earth, who is a, a, a Sri Lankan politician and a, a paramilitary leader. The meek, after all, will be arranged in heat little rows in their respective refugee camps, eating their lunch from the tinsel packs dispensed by the World Food Program. And this was exactly a kind of visionary words which he saw, which is going to happen to the Tamils. And this is connected to his death, directly connected to his death, because this basically challenged euphoria that was prevailing at that moment. And therefore, Lasanta's example clearly shows if you are going to deal with such issues, basically questions the state ability to commit crimes, state's willingness to commit crimes, then it always comes with a price. And that is the reason why most of the journalists, the colleagues we are, have, we are having on the ground, whenever they get kind of controversial information or evidence, they try to put it out. They try to push it out of the country because they know we can do it better than them because of the consequences are different for us compared to their, the consequences they will have to face. I would like to, another of the purpose of this tribunal, as you know well, is to analyze and, and very much bring to the record the impunity levels. You mentioned reprisal that was taken against you during your time in exile in, in Berlin. Is that, could you perhaps, and maybe it's, it's the work of the, of the Journalists for Democracy as well, recording a little bit that such impunity, they can be passive by not allowing anybody to seek or to obtain justice and truth, but also active by uh, taking legal actions or applying the terrorist charges and, and their like. Would you just give us a little bit of a sense of how that, that has happened or it keeps happening in Sri Lanka? Well. That is uh, exactly related to the answer that I uh, gave initially, because uh, we can't uh, discuss the crimes committed against media separated from the crimes committed against the Tamils and now the Muslims. And the reason is because these are state crimes. And whichever the regime that is going to rule Sri Lanka, unless they radically break from this tradition of committing crimes, against their own citizens. This problem will remain. And if you take the example of the regime change that happened in 2015, 
and which lasted for four months, four years. Uh, everybody started thinking that it is a kind of a progress, that we are making progress because now there are no killings. But I think the most strongest kind of uh, witness against that narrative is in this room with us, is Sandhya. And the experience that Sandhya had during that garment, giving the hope, giving her the hope that there will be justice uh, uh, delivered. And at the end of the day, she faced more risks and she had to send her children out because they were at risk and, uh, uh, more than uh, her actually. So what matters is actually the policy of total impunity is uh, a kind of, I mean, apart from the state criminality, the impunity is actually the elephant in the room. And as long as you don't deal with the past crimes, you don't need to commit new crimes because by leaving the crimes as it is and leaving the perpetrators free, they are giving a clear, they are sending a clear message to the others saying that we have like 44 number, the number 44 journalists and media workers who have been killed. If you want to cross the line, still it is like that. And no perpetrator has been basically uh, uh, brought to justice. And that sends a clear message to everyone who is thinking of writing something against or exposing something that deals with the state crimes. And impunity is what connects the government after government. Uh, one government commit crimes and the next government reward them with impunity. And when they commit crimes, their successor would reward them with impunity, which has been the case since the 50s and 60s. None of, the, we are talking about Sri Lanka when it comes to mass uprisings and rebellions. We are talking about numbers like 15,000, 60,000, 100,000 people getting killed. But we haven't seen a single case where their state perpetrators were brought to justice. They were brought to book and justice delivered to the victims. There had been no incident like that since 1970s at least. So we are living in a country where it seems like one of the oldest democracies in Asia, where there's a functioning democracy, functioning state, free media, multi-party system and all these things. But we are also, we have second largest number of, second highest number of disappearances in the world. And one of the most uh, largest, I mean, uh, the numerically most number of uh, mass graves were find, found in Sri Lanka. So there's a obscene underbelly to the celebrated democracy in Sri Lanka. And that is created by the crimes of the state. Thank you very much. I don't have any more questions. I don't know if you want to add anything from your prior statement, and if not, the, the, the panel of judges may have some questions. Uh, no, I will wait for the questions. Thank you. Do we have any questions from, yes, uh, uh, can I have, Gil, could you speak? Um. Yeah, two two questions. One clarification and a question. I'll take the. I'll use the question first. Um, I wanted to know: Are there any significant organized crime groups in Sri Lanka, and is there any evidence of their involvement in any attacks on the journalists there or other state crimes? Uh, yes, in the sense that. Uh, some of the crimes that uh, that involves these 44 journalists were either carried out by directly by the state armed forces and at times by the paramilitaries which are unofficially backed by the state and uh, because i i have a sub I mean, a submission to make which i will hand it uh, over to the judges which details i mean uh, the victims all the details of the victims along with the dates they were killed where they were killed and their photographs uh, and they, they include the journalists as well as media workers and some of the, I mean, most of these media workers are also killed simply because they have worked in the wrong newspaper or the wrong media outlet. And therefore, the organized, uh, the biggest organized criminal group or the criminal gang in the country is the state itself. And when they are not uh, ready to do or carry out something in open, they would outsource it to certain groups that have been funded and backed by the state. 
Okay, thank you. Um, and I'm sorry, but my hearing is not great. Um, and I didn't understand what you were saying right at the beginning about the 44, the 38, and the 35. Could you clarify that for me, please? Yeah, I will. Uh... So I just want to, yeah, it's, I said uh, the, since April 2004, that was the time the United People's Freedom Alliance came to power, uh, from which the current, uh, the previous president Mahindra Rajapaksha contested in the same year. But at the time, April 2004, he was the prime minister of the country. And uh, since 2004, April, uh, there had been 44 journalists up till the disappearance of Prageet Eknaligoda. 44 media workers and journalists have either been killed or disappeared, made to disappear. And out of these 44, at least 38 of them, the direct, I mean, the perpetrator is the state. And some of the journalists have been killed uh, by the rebel groups, and some of the journalists died in bomb explosions. And this 38, out of this 38, 35 remain Tamil. So there's a clear Tamil. ethnic dimension, the Tamil community, because there's a clear ethnic dimension to the crimes committed against media, which is actually connected to the crimes committed against the larger Tamil community. So killing Tamil journalists is part of committing crimes against the Tamil community. Okay, thanks. That's, that's amazing. Disturbing. Uh, thank um, you. Thank yeah, you. could I, could I, could I oh, just sorry, a, a, ask another you. question re relating to the to the outsourcing of crime by the state? And you said that there are groups that are um, funded by by the state or employed by the state, direct directed or requested to kill or disappear. Are these actually, in some cases, organized criminal groups? Or are they, for example, as in the Philippines, uh, considered uh, vigilantes? Uh, not exactly. It's a the, it's a mode of operandi is completely different uh, when it comes to Sri Lanka, because these groups are uh, either directly uh, controlled by the state armed forces, or they are appear to be uh, ex I mean functioning uh, independently but actually they are politically affiliated to the, uh, to the government, uh, government in right. power. And these groups actually, these paramilitaries, which is known uh, mostly as paramilitaries, are yes. not like, uh, like a gang of criminals, like what you see in Philippines or many other countries, probably in uh, Mexico. Uh, yeah. But here it's actually, they have been uh, paid by the government and they are working along with the government forces. Right, yeah. They have that in the Philippines too. Yes, thank you. That's very clear now. Marina, did you have a question or not? Thank you. I have no further question. It has been very, very clear so far. Thank you. Yeah, Mr. Jayavardhani, uh, yeah, sorry, Avivardhani. Um, thank you for giving that larger picture and connecting uh, the issue of, you know, what's happening in Sri Lankan society to the specifics of the murders of journalists. So my question to you is this, that you said that the self-censorship is by the journalists and not because of the structure of the media. So I want to understand this because pre the Tamil war, even during Siri Mabo's time, the mainstream uh, press, Sinhala press particularly, was never very critical of the government in power, from my understanding. And uh, that seemed to continue, you know. And it's only in the later part when you had some independent television stations that came up, as well as the opening of the internet, that the spaces were created for dissent. So my question to you is, why do you say that it's the journalists themselves? Wasn't it because they were associated with media houses that chose to keep the government happy because they knew what the consequences were, were even before the Tamil Elam uh, yeah. struggle? Yeah. Uh, there are two, two, actually, there are two aspects to this uh, uh, 
uh, question because one thing is actually in Sri Lanka the ownership of media is deeply connected to the pol uh, the pol uh, people who are in power so there are family connections there are business connections as anywhere in the world and uh, there are there are political connections as well because some of them are actually while running the paper they are part of they are playing a big part in the ruling parties or uh, the organizations affiliated to ruling parties but uh, having said that now they of course they determine the content of the newspapers but uh, there's also a lack of uh, willingness uh, on the side of the journalist i'm not talking about all the journalists in the country there are quite a lot of journalists in the south as well as all the journalists i would say in the north and east who are coming from the tamil tamil journal, who are paying the, the biggest price actually uh, and tamils don't uh, tamil journalists actually tamil media workers basically uh, they don't care the, about the consequences because they have seen the worst so they will always uh, cross the line and they will expose what they are going through because it's it's the it's a matter of their existence but when it's come to the journalists who are working in the south it's a matter of choice whether you want to expose something that actually goes against the ideological beliefs that you are holding which connects you to the state and that connection is basically determined on the racial lines and the journalists the way they report on the crimes that are committed by the state is whether we committed the crimes against the tamils or not not the state committed the crimes so they always try to because the denial is what makes us a nation we commit crimes when it comes to victims when the victims are tamils or muslims we make an alliance with each other the politicians with the journalists and journalists with the media owners and with the writers and intellectuals and everyone we have we are basically making an alliance uh to constitute i mean like basically to express ourselves collective self as a nation and when the tamil tigers were there our existence uh and our collective identity was determined as opposed to tamil tigers so we are a nation because we have been threatened by the existence of the tamil tigers and once the tamil tigers were taken off the equation then there was a problem a dilemma how are you going to i mean basically express your collective self and then the denial helped us to collect i mean uh, express ourselves as a nation and denial is what even now makes us a nation because we say we, people's I mean, world i mean countries in the world accuse us for committing crimes which we didn't which we haven't committed and those who basically agree with that uh, kind of denial makes part of the nation and the journalists are part of it and very few journalists who have the guts and the courage to challenge that narrative and to write something which goes against this denial and to say that no the state has committed basically crimes and we basically turn a blind eye when the crimes are committed and very few journalists are still there who are trying to do this job in the south but a majority of journalists are also are actually part of this ideological alliance which makes them close to the state Thank you very much for your important testimony. And could you give us your opinion um, on the role played by the judiciary um, on the level of judicial uh, protection and reaction against crimes, violence, and threat to journalists? Thank well, you. unfortunately, the judiciary has not played any positive role when it comes to crimes not only against, uh, about the crimes against journalists but the crimes by the state and uh, uh, i can give you one example uh, a colleague a journalist colleague of mine uh, mr j s tisanayagam who was a very senior journalist who used to work for two decades in the country as a journalist at least over two decades i would say and in 2008 march he was arrested and he was arrested when he went to visit his publisher who was arrested the previous day by the terrorist investigation division and when he went to inquire about his uh, well-being he was arrested and then they charged him for writing two articles initially they charged him for being part of the tamil rebel outfit the ltte and when there was no evidence to prove that can be used against him they kept changing the accusations and finally he was charged for writing two articles which he wrote in 2008 and 2007 actually 
uh, about the massive displacement happening in the eastern part of the country. And these two articles was basically dealing with the refugee crisis, refugees generated by the war effort. And it has nothing to do with uh, inciting violence against uh, other communities. But he was, uh, he was basically accused for this crime. And what happened was there was a court case, which is a sham court case, I would say. And as a result of the court case, he was sentenced to 20 years in prison, rigorous imprisonment for writing two articles. And finally, because there was a huge campaign, uh, especially international campaign, which had a huge impact, he was released. And judiciary, knowing well the whole uh, problem and the, especially the treatment, that they, the, the, way, the, the way they were treated inside the terrorist investigation division, they turned a blind eye and they went with the, the state narrative because they were given a job and they wanted to do the job. Only now, after a very long time, now we are seeing small changes, but that is also uh, when the Sinhala protesters uh, are being targeted in the last month. The Sri Lanka Bar Association has made interventions. And I hope they would intervene in the same manner to the uh, uh, intimidation and the harassment uh, the Tamils are facing and the Muslims are facing in the country. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your testimony. I would like to go back to something that you already mentioned, and I'm sorry, uh, but I, I would like to highlight some of the point that probably you already, you already underscore. Uh, the prosecutor asked you about self-censorship, and one of my colleagues also asked something similar and you start talking about brave journalists that are still reporting or something like that. My question is regarding the point of view of the people in Sri Lanka. Is there any possibility today to receive fair information? Is there still, you mentioned brave journalists that are reporting or the situation is that bad that it's almost impossible to receive information uh, fair information uh, in 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 Sri Lanka. Thank you. Well, uh, uh, if you refer to the current situation, if you are referring to the current situation, uh, the biggest problem is actually uh, in Sri Lanka now. There's it's, it has become impossible to publish newspapers because uh, there's no paper, and uh, the newspapers uh, are not being published regularly now. And even if they are published in the papers, big companies, of course. Uh, the number of pages are quite limited because of the paper shortage. And when it comes to electronic media, the electronic media is generally run by groups and companies either close to government or any of the uh, official uh, op 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 parliamentary opposition. And therefore, I mean, the, the cracks from which the information flows out is created by the political kind of contradictions between the uh, media outlets which have been backed by other parties and the state policies. And not because they have taken a principal stand of the, their duty as, as a duty to expose and to uh, inform the people about the truth. It's not because of that. And it's mainly the cracks are generated by the political contradictions so the political opposition between parties. And that opposition has been reflected in media as well. So the media space, basically media landscape, is not, uh, there's no such thing uh, called a principal position of bringing information to the people, even though this has been repeatedly said by all the media. It's a very few alternative uh, couple of newspapers were there who were trying to expose all these things. But the problem is now they are fighting to survive because of the difficulties at the moment. Gil, yes, can you come in from Australia? Yes, um, I wanted to um, add a few things to, to what you said about the judiciary. Um, even when uh, a, a person is high up in, in the military as General Fonseca, he could be uh, facing trumped up charges and, and tossed into, into prison for three years. In fact, uh, they gave him an extra three years. 
but that whole thing is is quite fascinating um the way anybody who challenged i i believe he said that, that there were possibly some more crimes and they should be investigated so he was someone who was challenging the state narrative um and he had also lost the election uh to uh, uh mahinda uh raja paksa uh so they really dealt with him but in turn um when uh sirisena became president um he he rehabilitated fonseca entirely and brought him back into the into the government so that's one case um the second case which i don't know much about which you may or may not wish to comment on um involved the hambantota um scam that uh, mahinda uh, was was involved in and he was cleared and uh, of of corruption um and as i say i don't know the details but the chief justice is said to have cleared him and later and this often happens you know later when it doesn't matter uh he apologized to the country and said it was the biggest mistake of his life um the other thing i wanted to mention which you may want to uh, elaborate it it's very interesting to me uh, as as a law professor etc um and someone who's researched these issues in 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 the philippines um the attorney ge- attorneys general um uh, under most of these regimes seem to have really dragged their feet uh and blocked investigations or not allowed them uh to prosper in any way but on the other hand uh and this is something i don't quite understand because it seems to me unusual and contradictory um it does seem that a number of the organizations um the fcid the cid and some others do seem to have carried out investigations and uh hoped to be able to uh uh or 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 indeed did 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 uh bring charges and and presumably hoped for some some positive result from their hard work um can you talk a little bit about about uh, attorneys general and and particularly the the um the lack of success that these organizations had even though they appear to have tried to do something well uh i will start from the uh, hambantota scam what uh, the chief justice said because what the chief justice said at the moment at, at that i mean after he retired from his position during opposition i mean political rally of the opposition parties he said the biggest mistake in his life what was to set uh, mahindra rajapaksha free even after knowing that he was involved in that scam basically it's about collecting funds for the tsunami victims and taking money yeah. from that and Shocking. then what happened was after that in the next election he became again he uh, climbed up to the platform the same platform that he said the person who uh, committed this uh, kind of scam and uh, he supported mahindra rajapaksha in the next election campaign so yeah. this i mean you can't i mean basically there's no principal position he made this uh, statement while he was supporting the opposition and then retracted it when he decided to support again the same person that he accused of uh, committing i mean basically uh, involved in corruption and when it uh, the question about attorney general's department and attorney general at least in my lifetime i have never seen an independent kind of uh, uh, role played by the attorney, uh, attorney general and basically whoever had been in the position basically what they are supposed to do is to clear the government from responsibility of various mm-hmm. crimes the government committed and also go after the people who are actually challenging the government and try to uh, 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 prosecute them for something completely fabricated charges and this has been the role and the job of the attorney general's department from a long since whichever the government comes into power this has been the role so it's a matter of changing positions and changing people but uh, the role of the attorney general department is basically to clear the government uh, in power from all the crimes that they have committed 
And, and could you say something about the investigative institutions uh, that I that I mentioned, and to what extent they they actually did and do try? Sorry, uh, can you uh, refer to the organization? I can't remember exactly. Yeah, yeah, Sorry? yeah. Okay, yeah, CID, and yeah, this was actually yeah. this all these uh, bodies comes into existence when a new government come to power. And in the course of the time, normally, they start abandoning the cases. And whether the officers involved are uh, really uh, interested in carrying out the investigations or not is a matter that is completely unrelated to the decisions that is government going to take on the, victim, on the, uh, the perpetrators or the people who are involved in those uh, corruption kind of scandals. And the best example, I mean, uh, was actually the case of Pragit Ignaligoda. Now, the state... Uh, basically, it appeared to be like the criminal investigative department was after going after the real culprits, and they arrested a couple of uh, uh, people who are actually uh, who are actually members of the uh, state armed forces who are from the intelligence wing. And so, initially, there was high hopes about uh, that the justice will be delivered, and within the next three years, gradually one by one, they came out from prison and they were reinstated. Uh, in the same position, and that uh, created more risks uh, for per people like Sandhya, because uh, more than uh, uh, the the risks that they had already faced during the previous governments. So it it it, it also I mean has a clear connection to the CID's uh, kind of investigations. There had been huge information I mean being gathered, accumulated against certain people, and at the end of the day, nobody knows what happened to this. Uh, information and finally all these people went to uh, courts and they were uh, absolved from all the charges. So there's mm -hmm. a kind of division of labor between all these investigative bodies, the judiciary and the, polit uh, the, the parliament and the executive. So this division of labor is what determines the outcome of the investigations. Uh, thank you. Uh, I want to know if there are some patterns uh, to silence journalists if they receive death threats before, or surveillance, uh, warnings, or torture, jail, I don't know, or direct, they go and kill them or disappear. Also, how many how many are disappear? Like if how it operates, and if there is a difference in these patterns between journalists in north and south, also if if there is a difference in the behavior uh, or roles with where they are committed by militars, police, paramilitars, or whoever do it? Well, uh, I think uh, about the numbers and uh, the, the numbers, how many have been killed and how many have been disappeared. Uh, as I'm hoping to submit this document, uh, it's all detailed in this. I mean, all the details have been given in this document, so you can uh, have a look at it and see how many have been abducted and made to disappear, and how many have been uh, assassinated. And the thing is, actually, uh, also the ethnic dimension of the killings can be easily see, uh, seen by the. I mean, from the details, you can easily uh, see the details. Uh, but apart from that, actually, the thing is, uh, getting a formal warning is a luxury in a country like Sri Lanka, because nobody gets that kind of warnings. And mm. from what I remember, only in the case of this, uh, the person I mentioned earlier, uh, J.S.T. Sanayagam, the journalist who was uh, sentenced to 20 years rigorous imprisonment. So now, he's the only journalist, who, uh, and there were actually one or two others who were, uh, who were sent to jail. But most of the journalists, well, didn't receive. I mean, the thing is, actually, when you live and work in a country like Sri Lanka, your instinct guides you. And the journalists work just following their in instinct. And when the instinct says that you are in real danger without receiving any kind of formal threat, you react to that instinct, actually. That is how it has been all the time. And if there had been a formal way of letting journalists know that you have been targeted and you will be dealt with, many of the journalists would have survived. Many of the journalists would have been, I mean, would have survived because they would have reacted and planned their work according to the risks that they are facing. But the thing, what happens is, they always come for you. They always come for you, and they uh, there's no kind of stages of the threats. You write something, 
and you get killed. And that's the pattern of the uh, state uh, perpetrated crimes against journalists. And there's no other pattern. There's no other formal warning, sending letters, colleagues, uh, sending. I mean, there had been instances, for example, a person like Lasanta has been receiving such calls for a very long time. But the thing is, when you get used to that kind of threatening calls, it becomes part of your profession. And you don't take this call is more dangerous than the previous call that you get. So as a result of it, there's always a tipping point at a certain point they decide to get rid of that person, which has happened to Lasanta. Um, I don't know if there are some survivors of torture or this, or all the people who survived, they are on exile, exiled or? There are survivors actually. There are survivors who were abducted, tortured, and then survived. Uh, like for example, in 2009, uh, the Secretary of uh, Working Journalists Association of Sri Lanka who briefly went into exile, hoping that he would, you know, he would hoping to stay outside for a while and then go back to Sri Lanka, which he did, and was abducted, and then tortured, and he, I mean, he basically he was uh, almost almost uh, pushed to his death. I mean, everybody was I mean, expected that he might get killed when the news came that he was abducted, but fortunately he survived, and then he had to leave the country. And there are others as well. Quite a lot of journalists were abducted, and for various reasons, they survived. Just by chance, they survived. And many of them had to leave the country. Only very few, as far as I know, who remain inside the country. But also, if they decide to remain inside the country, they have decided to change the way they work. So they have never been in, uh, critical in the same way uh, that they used to be earlier, after such abduction or torture. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Bashana. I have uh, two questions. One is um, the editorial that La Santa wrote, um, as you said, five days, I think, before he was killed. Um, is it possible for you to pr provide that to us? Yes. Um, because I think we've all seen yes. the editorial posthumously, yeah. but uh, I, I haven't seen this earlier one. Um, in fact, your whole testimony is, is full of information that we need to uh, go through. Um, my second question relates to the current situation and whether you see any um, break in the uh, pattern of, uh, of Sinhala um, dismissal of the, of the Tamil issue uh, within, the, within the current protesters. Is this uh, beginning to change? Any sensitivity coming forward? We are, are told uh, that there is a, an inter-ethnic and inter-class or cross-class uh, representation in the, in the demonstrations. Uh, but I'd like to hear a little bit more about yeah. whether uh, this sensitivity to the Tamil question uh, coming forward and also the extent of, uh, of participation by Tamils uh, in the, in the protests? Well, unfortunately, my answer is uh, uh, such kind of deep understanding about the Tamil issue, or even the issues of Muslims, is not part of the ongoing campaign. The ongoing protest campaign is basically the dominant kind of uh, thinking in that campaign is uh, determined by the economic difficulties the people are facing. And the criticism that has been leveled against Rajapaksha by the protesters uh, is basically uh, determined by highlighting the Rajapaksha the thief, not the Rajapaksha the murderer. So the criminality aspect of Rajapaksha's rule has been left out because there's a certain feeling that if you bring that out, that would benefit the Tamils or even the Muslims. So there's a, I mean, if you look at the pattern of the whole pro, I mean, this is, I'm saying while admiring the kind of courage shown by the young protesters who have actually tried to break this. And it's a very, I mean, isolated cases where people uh, came onto streets with all the other placards and slogans. They used to have certain slogans which basically highlighted the criminality aspect of the state to say, this is what you did to the Tamils and now you are going to do it to us. And this is very, this is not a, com a very uh, 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 common thing that you could see in, uh, among the protesters. 
but quite isolated, and they are doing it at uh, taking great risks actually in the south. And the other thing is actually, when you look at the whole protest campaigns, the level of Tamil involvement in the campaign uh, from the north and east is very limited, not because that they don't hold the same kind of position when it comes to the state, but they have more grievances and they have more complaints to make, which is not accommodated by the larger protest, because if they come onto streets and say, this state committed war crimes against us, this state committed a genocide against the Tamil people, I don't know how many protesters would stand with such a slogan. Because that is why I said the connection they have with the state, and now what we can see, there's a connection which always the protester is connected to the state through their loyalty to the military. Because they are, they, I mean, they basically, they uh, despise Rajapakshas and they had confrontations with the special task force of the police and the police uh, themselves, but not with the military. And that is one of the reasons I believe that the state is not deploying military until recently onto the streets to confront the protesters. Because if you put this military on the ground and that would create a situation where the protesters will be compelled to confront the military. And if they confront the military, there will be consequences, and that consequences will determine how the people perceive the role of the military and their connection to the state, which is for the moment you can't see actually. So I think the state has, I mean, they are working in a calculated manner, in my opinion. They are analyzing and they are basically observing and analyzing the pattern of the protest and which classes are involved, which ethnic groups are involved, which political parties are involved and then getting the feedback from the intelligence, uh, members of the intelligence wing who have been deployed among the protesters to understand the internal dynamics of the protest. And one of the uh, major dynamics they must have seen is still there's a certain loyalty of these protesters to the state military, because from the slogans and the way they deal with the military, uh, it has been uh, reflected. And that the government, I think, does not want to uh, spoil. For the moment, at least, we see that kind of, uh, I mean, like, uh, great patience has been maintained on the side of the military, because if they lose the connection the protesters have with the military, and that ends the last thread that the protest uh, existing, which connects the protesters to the state. And that is why, until one month, the military was not deployed on the streets, until two days or three days ago when the military started rolling in, but that is also after the streets were cleared. So, so that, that problem is actually there. And the reason the Tamils cannot become a kind of uh, enthusiastic supporters or kind of part of the protest is because you come to a protest if you are being given an opportunity to voice your issues. And the Tamils are, I mean, Tamils have great issues like war crimes, crimes against humanity and genocide, which will not, any of, this, any of those issues will not be accommodated into the ongoing protest campaign because it basically uh, challenges the official narrative of the war victory and uh, the ending of terrorism, which is quite a, I mean, if that happens, that would be a historic moment of the history of uh, Sri Lanka. If the panel allows me, I have one question to finalize. Uh, and it's just to elaborate a little bit on the aspect of impunity, which I think is very important for this, uh, for this tribunal. We understand that they perhaps, or I shouldn't you know, just presume, but the, the connections between the police and the military with the executive and the people in government. And I know you hinted to questions of the panel, but where are the judges in all of this? Are they completely complicit? with uh, what's happening or is dictated from the executive? There's any dissidence within? Where, where are the, the, what is the judiciary in, in that universe? Well, we have seen rarely what you can call as dissidence, actually. Uh, any kind of dissidence we have seen quite rarely. And generally, the judiciary is a part of the problem. They have been always part of the problem. And the judges themselves, I mean, the getting being promoted to become a judge is also decided by the president himself. And uh, 
Am I answer, answering the question correctly? Yeah. Absolutely. So, uh, so the thing is actually uh, appointments. I mean, may, uh, it is up to the president to appoint the judges, basically. Because there had been changes made during the past couple of years, like 19th Amendment. Uh, but that has been reversed after this government came to power. And uh, so the independent judiciary is a, is a history, actually, in Sri Lanka. It's past. And... Uh, only in the last one month's time, we have seen a relative independence in the way the judiciary is making, the judges are making judgments, and also the role of the lawyers, uh, which we haven't seen for a very, very long time. And if that, uh, it's going, I mean, that tradition is going to survive, that would be good for the country. But I don't know how long that would uh, be the case, and I'm not uh, sure about that. Thank you very much. Yes, from Gil. Yeah. Um, in the Philippines, the lawyers have been uh, killed uh, 70 in six years under Duterte. I was wondering about the, the lawyers, including prosecutors, judges, and attorneys or advocates. Have they also been killed or has it not been necessary since they are incorporated or are there differences between the judges and the the advocates and prosecutors well again the question depends on uh, which lawyers we are talking about because as lawyers as long as the lawyers are tamil and who have been representing the interests of the victims of the uh, victims of uh, the terror laws the counter terror laws uh, they are facing risk they have been facing risk for a very long time but when it comes to the uh, similar lawyers there hadn't been, in the recent past, there hadn't been any such incidents which involves, uh, basically, which has created risk for uh, lawyers in the South. Very few, very few, I would say. Uh, but in the 80s, of course, in the late 80s, quite a lot of lawyers were killed. Because at the time, the victims were Sinhalese, and there were so many lawyers who represented the victims. But uh, after 1990, there hadn't been any such incident which uh, involves killing of lawyers or killing of judges or forcing them into exile. Okay, then I think we're done. Thank you again very much for Can being I make part of Absolutely, yes. please. Uh, I just uh, request your permission to read out the names of this journalist just the names, because I think their names should be heard, because they are, these are just uh, not names, but they were killed because they were doing their job properly. And uh, since 2004, but there are more journalists who were killed before 2004, and I'm just uh, limiting, I mean, limiting to 2004 to 2010 because uh, the document basically deals with the crimes committed by the uh, current uh, rulers actually. Uh, 2004, Ayyaturi Nadesan from Batikalo, Kandasami Ayyar Bala uh, Nadaraja from Colombo, uh, Lanka Jayasundara, a journalist from Colombo, Dharmaratnam Sivaram, killed in Colombo, Kannamuttu Arasakumar, a media worker from Matupala, Kalmune, Relangi Selvaraja, a journalist from Colombo, David Selvaratnam, a media worker from Colombo, Yoga Kumar Krishna Pillai, a media worker from Batikalo, L.M. Falil, a writer from Batikalo, K. Navaratnam, a media worker from Jaffna, Subramanian Suhir Tarajan, a journalist from Trincomali, S.T. Gananadan, the patron of the Tamil News and Information Center from Jaffna, Bastian George Satyadas, uh, Sagedas, media worker from Jaffna, Rajaratnam Ranjit Kumar, media worker from Jaffna, Sampar Lakmal de Silva, a journalist from Colombo, Maria Dasan Manojan, Manojan Raj, a media worker from Jaffna, Satasivam Baskaran, a media worker from Jaffna, Sinatambi Siva Maharaja, media owner from Jaffna, S. Ravindran, media worker from Jaffna, Subramaniam Ramachandran, a journalist from Jaffna, Chandrabos Sudhakar, a journalist from Vaunia, 
Selaraja Rajivarman, journalist from Jaffna, Sahadevan Nilakshan, a journalist from Jaffna, Antoni Pille Sherin uh, Sitirajan, Sitiranjan, media worker from Jaffna, Vadivelu Nimalaraj, media worker from Jaffna, Isevili Champion, journalist from Kilinochi, Suresh Limbio, media worker from Kilinochi, T. Dharmalingam, media worker from Kilinochi, W. Gunasinghe, a journalist from uh, Kabiti Gollava, Central, North Central Province, Parani Rupa Singham Devakumar, journalist from Jaffna, Mohammad Rasmi Maharuf, journalist from Anuradhapura, Rasaya Jayendiran, journalist from Mulativ, Lasanta Vikramatunga, journalist from Colombo, Punyamurti Satyamurti, journalist from Mulativ, Sasi Madan, media worker from Mulativ, Nalaya Maheswaran, media worker from Mulativ, Maria Nayaga Manton Benedict and his whole family was killed in this incident. And there's no one we could even get a photograph of him from Mulativ. Rajkumar Mary Densi, media worker from Mulativ. Jairaja Susidara Sugandan, media worker from Mulativ. Arulappan Antoni Kumar, media worker from Mulativ. Thurai Singham Tarshan, media worker from Mulativ. Isai Priya, also known as Shobana Dharmaraja, a media a journalist from Mulativ. Tirukul Singhan Tawabalan, journalist and political activist from Mulativ. Pragi Teknaligoda, journalist from Colombo. And these are all, not just names, but everyone involves and everyone mentioned in this list as a family, people who are looking for justice, who have not been delivered, given justice. And we are here, I mean, as, as journalists for democracy in Sri Lanka, I am here to emphasize the need for justice because this is what we lack for decades. And I come from a generation which went through a massacre uh, where 60,000 got killed and we didn't get justice. And Tamil people have been living through genocidal policies, getting killed on a daily basis until 2009. And then this genocidal process continues, but there's no justice. And the Muslim people, who have been targeted routinely by the racist thugs uh, sponsored by the governments and uh, state, and now languishing in prisons under uh, draconian laws like Prevention of Terrorism Act in hundreds, they have not got justice. And what shape our lives in Sri Lanka is actually not the way we live, the way my people in the country live, but the way people died. And to change that, we need justice. And that is all that, I mean, we have been talking about democracy, we have talking about quite a lot of things, but justice has been missing, which connects one decade to another, and that decade to a next decade, is not traditions of uh, fraternity, traditions of uh, solidarity, but what connects all these decades is actually the crimes that were committed and the terror that we have witnessed from the state. And the legacy of Sri Lanka is a legacy of terror, a legacy of unspeakable crimes. And all these crimes need, people who survive these crimes need justice. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bashana. We will now continue with a, a lunch break and we will resume at a quarter past one.
Welcome back at the Sri Lanka case hearing of the People's Tribunal on the murder of journalists. I call the next witness, Mr. Steve Butler of the Committee to Protect Journalists. Good afternoon, Mr. Butler, and welcome. Um, as you know, the routine a little bit, I will ask you a very open question. If you could please introduce yourself and also the, specifically the, the work in the Asian um, desk, for lack of a better definition, at the, at the Commission to Protect Journalists. And then, Miguel Semi, thank you very much. Sure. Thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you to the tribunal for the opportunity to speak here. Uh, it's humbling in a way because this work of, of finding uh, who's responsible for the murder of journalists is terribly important. So far this year, we have documented the, the death of 30 journalists around the world. 17 of those we have confirmed are related to their work. Uh, and we're continuing to research the other cases, and we will almost certainly find more. If history is any guide, uh, there may be two convictions related to those murders. We hope we can change that ratio somehow, and this is a good place to start. Um, my background is I started, uh, I have a political science uh, PhD from Columbia University. I spent over 20 years uh, as a foreign correspondent in Asia. Uh, reporting from different parts of the region. Um, I returned to the United States about 20 years ago and served as a foreign editor for the Knight Ritter uh, newspaper chain during the Iraq and the, um, and the Afghan wars. Um, I joined CPJ six years ago and I have, uh, you know, I'm, I uh, fo you know, follow, manage the Asia program there. Uh, CPJ has been monitoring and documenting press freedom violations in Sri Lanka for many decades since our founding in 1982. Uh, CPJ work consists of three principal components. And the first and probably the foundation and most important part is documenting the violations. We go to great lengths to try to dis uh, discern the facts when journalists are attacked or when press freedom violations occur. We have a program of direct assistance to journalists that includes help uh, paying for legal, medical costs, relocation, emergency assistance, and we also provide uh, extensive security advice uh, for journalists on the ground, both digital and, and physical. And finally, uh, we are very active advocating on behalf of journalists uh, to governments. We, we, we travel around the world to meet with uh, government leaders and try to push uh, for, the, um, for the protection of journalists and the promotion of, of, of the free press. And, and to give you an example of this, my predecessor in this position, Bob Dietz, uh, left for Colombo immediately on the news of the murder of La Santa Wakramatunga, and he was able to provide documentation from the actual site of the murder within a few days. And uh, he also, at that time, visited Sandra at her home, um, and we have, um, we have many dozens of reports on attacks against journalists in Sri Lanka, and regularly send staff to the country to report on the situation there. Most recently, just before the COVID-19 pandemic made travel impossibility. And to repeat this, reliably documenting the facts is the foundation of all of our work. And for this testimony, I'm relying on my own work, but also the extensive work of my CPJ colleagues. I would like to share facts uh, initially on a, a few emblematic cases that we have documented in Sri Lanka. And I would stress that while these cases have been relatively prominent, they are representative of the kind of, of repression that all journalists have faced there. Uh, this morning, um, Bashana already raised the case of, of uh, J.S. Tisanagayam, who, who was arrested after reporting, among other things, on the recruitment and training of child soldiers in 2008. He wrote a regular column for the Sunday Times, reflecting a moderate you know, Tamil point of view that was often highly critical of the government. He was arrested in March uh, 2008, and months later was charged with terrorism, for which he was convicted and sentenced to 20 years in prison in September 2009. Under intense international pressure, including uh, from CPJ, and after the civil war had ended, 
He was granted a full pardon and allowed to emigrate to the United States in 2010. In fact, he had committed no crime other than reporting embarrassing news and publishing critical opinions. Another very important case from that era uh, was the case of uh, Keith Neuer. On the night of May 22, 2008, uh, the deputy, he, as deputy editor of the nation newspaper, he was abducted in a white van when he returned home. His wife discovered the car outside the home with the engine still running. His abduction followed by less than two weeks a highly critical article he wrote entitled, An Army is Not a Commander's Private Fiefdom. He was beaten in the van and later reportedly reported that he was stripped and suspended in the air and beaten again. The beating stopped when his abductors received a phone call from a higher authority apparently ordering them to stop. He was free the next day, barely able to walk, his body covered with contusions and bleeding from the air. He soon left for Australia and he did not return, although he has cooperated with investigators in the case. While arrests were eventually made some 10 years after the incident, all suspects were freed on bail, and the case, like others, has ground to a halt following the election of Gotabaya Rajapaksa to the presidency. Just weeks after Neuer's capture and beating, Namal Pereira was again subject to a classic attempt at abduction while his car was chased on the street by motorcycles and an unmarked white van. The highly unusual twist of Pereira's story is that he survived and many years later identified his attackers in a police lineup. In 2008, Pereira was a freelance journalist and deputy head of the Sri Lanka Press Institute, a media advocacy group. Pereira had written critically of the government's war effort. He told me in 2017 that he was likely identified because his name card was in the wallet of Keith Neuer. Prior to the attack, Pereira had noticed the surveillance of, the off of his office at the Press Institute for several days. On the day of the attack, his car was followed when he left the office. Pereira's driver took evasive action, and when the attackers forced the car to stop, it was in a relatively public location. His attackers smashed the car's winds windscreen, dragged out Pereira, then another passenger, and beat both severely. But the attackers stopped and fled as a crowd gathered. Uh, Pereira ended up in the hospital, and there are pictures of him that, that show the extent of his injuries. Um, under the Sarasena government, progress in, in the investigation led to an arrest after he identified the attackers in this lineup. But after the change in the government, nothing has happened. Finally, I'd like to mention the case of Iqbal Athas. Iqbal Athas is a veteran defense correspondent for the Sunday Times, who is currently the political editor. In 1997, I, I, would, I would just point out that this uh, tendency toward uh, censorship began well before um, the Civil War was in, was in full swing, but, but it, it intensified during that period. In 1997 and 1998, he wrote articles about the disappearance of 70,000 mortar shells purchased by the government, resulting in, in verbal and physical abuse by government officials and thugs. In 1998, after he wrote about irregularities in the aircraft purchases by the Air Force, two bodyguards of an of, of an Air Force officer entered his home and threatened his family at gunpoint. These two were later convicted, and the government pr uh, provided guards at his home. Formal censorship came into force in, in 2000, and Athas found many, of his, many parts of his columns blanked out, including criticism of the government's war effort against Tamil separatists. In 2005, the Sri Lanka president threatened to use the Official Secrets Act against Athas after he described the purchase of a British landing craft as a waste of money. In 2007, when Gotabaya Rajapaksa was Defense Secretary, after Athas reported corruption in a deal to purchase MiG fighters from Ukraine, the government withdrew security protection and orchestrated demonstrations outside his home. During the next several years, Athos was forced several times to go into temporary exile outside of Sri Lanka to seek safety. 
including around the time that Lasantha was murdered. I think it's worth quoting um, in 2007, I'm sorry, 2008, uh, Gotabaya Rajapaksa, when he was Defense Secretary, gave an interview uh, to the, uh, local media. And let me quote from what he said. I think there is no need to report anything on the military. People do not want to know how many and what kind of arms we acquired. That is not media freedom. I tell without fear that I have power. I will not allow any of these things to be written. I told the president to bring press censorship in at the beginning. He went on to name several media companies um, and calling, calling them prostituted. You know, broadly speaking, uh, I see two patterns in these cases. The first is that journalists were attacked, and I say this with great certainty, by government-linked forces outside of any plausible law enforcement regime. The journalists were not accused of breaking any law. They were attacked and punished for fact-based reporting and opinion, and then warned against any repetition. Their reports found misconduct by the government and the military. Second, uh, laws were indeed used against some journalists, questionably so, but nonetheless, the government made use of law enforcement mechanisms to curb press freedom. We see this in the case of Iqbal Athas, where some of his work was legally censored and, and where he was threatened to use the Official Secrets Act against him. In Tissa's case, it was the use of the implausible use of the anti-terrorism laws that put him in prison and forced him to seek exile. The use of the prevention of terrorism law has continued to hang over journalists as a threat and has recently been employed. Lanka E News journalist Keithy Ratnyake was held on remand for eight months from last October under this law, ostensibly because of the obviously non-criminal act of warning an Indian diplomat about a possible attack on the embassy. But we are convinced he was in reality held in retaliation for critical reporting in the exile publication Lanka E News. After eight months, he was ordered released by the court for lack of any evidence. So, these, the, so the, the prevention of terrorism law is used as a threat. And most recently, CPJ has documented repeated harassment of prominent Tamil journalists by the anti-terror police, including forcing journalists to submit to hours of intrusive questioning at police offices. Uh, the, the PTA has become a sword of Damocles hanging over the heads of all Sri Lankan journalists. Human Rights Watch recently and very appropriately described the law as a legal black hole. So, and very recently I would also add, I, I don't want to go into the details, but several journalists who have been uh, put under interrogation in this way have, have actually left the country uh, out of fear for what will happen to them. So in other words, uh, this kind of behavior by the government has not stopped. Following the 2015 elections and the installation of the Sarasena government, we saw important steps taken to investigate some cases. At a December 2017 UNESCO conference on impunity and cr for crimes against journalists, government officials complained of steep obstacles for investigating these cases, in part caused by the destruction of evidence by the previous outgoing government of Mahinda Rajapaksa. Nonetheless, in the investigations continued for several years. Suspects were identified and arrests were made. But then, universally, bail was granted and the process came to a halt with the election of Gotabaya Rajapaksa. Yes, there remain severe evidentiary difficulties in, in sustaining convictions in these cases, but the primary obstacle is political whether or not there is willpower in these cases on the part of the government to seek justice. There's no secret today that Sri Lanka's future is highly uncertain with the government under siege and a declaration of a state of emergency. Journalists face an unknown set of risks should they continue to speak out on these cases and the potential, uh, and the potential legal response of the current uh, president of Sri Lanka and others. These potential threats by the government are becoming explicit. On May 6th, just last week, the government issued regulations threatening criminal action under the public security ordinance, ordinance that contain the following language, which I've somewhat shortened here. No person shall, by word of mouth or by any other means whatsoever, 
spread any information likely to cause public alarm, public disorder, or racial violence on, on which it is likely to incite committing of an offense. Our experience in Sri Lanka and elsewhere is that governments cannot be trusted when given such broad authority to use legal means against critics who, whose truthful statements threaten to undermine their rule. This is precisely the situation facing many uh, in Sri Lanka who seek an end to impunity for the crimes against journalists. Should Gotabaya Rajapaksa remain in power, we can anticipate the possibility of escalating threats against journalists who speak out. Thank you. Thank you very much. I would love, if we can, um, to talk a little bit about patterns and about patterns. Yeah. They, um, because I think through the, the, your work and investigation and factual analysis at CPJ, I think you can help us and get the, the tribunal to understand. At a level, at, at different levels, first, I guess my question is about what patterns do we find on the attacks? You mentioned that the, all the journalists had attacked, um, but if you could describe exactly what those attacks, if they come with threatens, if we can establish that there is uh, laying a foundation of, of fear or restrict or forcing the journalist uh, to restrict himself or herself. I mean, you just first on the attack and then I'll follow up with other patterns as part of the of the venom. I think uh, as we discussed this morning, uh, I think you have to bifurcate the country into the north and, and the northeast uh, and the eastern part of the country because the, the Tamil journalists face a different sort of threat compared to the Sinhala journalists. And we have been told, the editors of, of prominent Tamil newspapers, they do in fact receive regular phone calls uh, from authorities warning them or asking for sources. These are very threatening and, and it, it, it with the result that they have to self-censor. They, they have to limit on what, what, they, uh, what they write about. These kinds of um, anti-terror interrogations of Tamil journalists that, that I mentioned, this doesn't happen in the, in the, with the, with, in the same way with the Sinhala community. It, is, is this what you're asking? And then from there, actually, very uh, for the second question, very much related to that. In the, also understand for the panel, the patterns on Precisely that, the application of the laws to intimidate and to harass. They're using, you may mention, Official Secrets Act, the Prevention Terrorist Act, and now more recently, the Public Security Ordinance. Could, can you just, because we, we know that they use it, but maybe perhaps more detail on how they put that into motion to, to coerce and to, to stop the work of journalism? Well, I think that the, the most outstanding you know, part of this history is that most of the attacks on journalists take place outside of any law enforcement uh, you know, regime. And if you look at these killings, the, the white van abductions, the beatings of journalists, um, you know, the, um, the predominantly, the fact that the Tamil journalists are predominantly the ones who are murdered uh, in journalists in, uh, in, in Sri Lanka. Now, some of these, some of these murders um, of the Tamil journalists, uh, they also uh, were carried out by Tamil extremists. Not all of them, you know, relate directly back to the government. Um, but you know, the the use of these uh, of, uh, for Prevention of Terrorism Act, it it you don't have to arrest very many journalists under this uh, under this kind of regime to get the point across, and it, it it just sends out a warning to all journalists that they have to conform. Sorry, the, where, um, and I know we also hinted at this morning, but in your opinion and your, uh, it was an informed opinion through the investigation of CPJ and beyond, where are the owners of the media outlets, the executives? I mean, who is behind, perhaps double question, who is behind the ownership and management of these media outlets and what is their uh, response and attitude towards the attacks on journalists and freedom of expression. Well, this this is the I, I, my my knowledge in this area is limited, um, but it 
the the major media in Sri Lanka are owned by several large corporations, uh, and th these these are people who have close ties to government officials. Uh, they're part of an of, of an elite in Sri Lanka, and they have every interest in trying to stay in business. The media is it's, it can be very profitable, um, and so so, yeah, so yes, they have an interest in moderating the kind of coverage uh, that takes place in the country. Perfect. And I suppose the, the situation in Sri Lanka and also came up this morning, we cannot ignore that it is pretty complicated as it is right now. Uh, journalists and, and freedom of expression were very, very much included. And what are the measures, the CPJ, you mentioned that you also, you protect journalists to put measures in place to protect them before they are attacked. How are you guys addressing this in the current moment and, and what, what are the priorities? Um, we publish security guides, uh, both uh, for physical and digital security. We recently translated them uh, both into Sinhala and Tamil languages, and we've uh, you know broadly distributing that. We are helping to pay for the relocation of some journalists. Um, to, so they can tempor temporarily seek safety, uh, you know, outside the country. We don't provide a long-term solution, but we we do help you know to relocate you know journalists when they're in trouble. These are the principal you know means that we have. Well, thank you very much. Is there anything else that you would like to add before I pass it to the panel? No, we can pass to the panel. That's okay, fine. thank you very much. I don't know if the panel has any questions. Can we see on the screen, please, for the remote um, members? Yes, I think uh, Gil Beringer has a question. Microphone, Gil. Thanks. Uh, have any of the journalists tried um, maintaining their own security, either a bodyguard or even an armored car. Um, these have been tried in the Philippines, but of course they're very expensive, so rarely used. Yep. But I was wondering if, if some kind of physical protection was was used at all. Yeah, I know that um, some of the senior editors or executives at the, the news groups do have armored cars. Yeah. The seniors. Yeah, I mean, yeah. It, this but, doesn't you know, it doesn't extend to yeah. the ordinary, ordinary hacks. Yeah. And, and sorry, you, you mentioned security guides. Could you describe them a little bit further? Well, we've accumulated a lot of experience over the years on how journalists can cover riots, for example, or demonstrations, um, and you know, and try to keep try to keep themselves safe. I mean, some of this is some of this is obvious. Uh, for example, stand to the side, don't stand in the middle. But others is not necessarily. Don't you know, don't put a camera around your neck, a camera strap around your neck, because uh, that you know you can be you can be yanked. Uh, digital security is more complicated, and um, you know a lot of journalists they work for um, they don't get paid very much. Uh, their their employers uh, don't provide very much uh, information about how to protect themselves. Um, I mean, just but just for example, um, in right now, if you you know you have journalists have so much information on their phone, and uh, so we tell them wipe it clean if you're going out in, you know in, in a situation you know and 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 you can restore it later. Uh, but you don't want to be you don't want to be caught by authorities with detailed information about who you've been phoning. Yeah. I mean, but this sort of thing, we, we, it's, it's fairly extensive, and, and, and a lot of it is it's not difficult to implement. Yeah, great. Thanks. Marina, yes. Yes, thank you. Um, uh, just one quick question. Uh, we heard in the case of Mexico that one of the problems confronting journalists is precisely what you were saying uh, a moment ago, uh, that uh, many journalists, uh, staff reporters, for instance, they are not very well paid. 
I mean, it is a precarious, uh, it is a precarious job for many of them. Uh, how much do you think that this is a problem in the case of Sri Lanka? How much this uh, has an influence, has an impact in the in the safety, in in, in I mean, in the vulnerability of uh, this journalist? Thank you. I mean, I think there are two issues. One, if we're talking about how to cover widespread demonstrations, th this is an issue that comes to the fore. If we're talking about state-sponsored attacks on journalists, I, I don't think the level of pay necessarily is an issue, except that um, if you're not very well paid and you're trying to survive, you're very likely to take fewer risks by, by criticizing the government. Um, but these kind of... Um, I mean, the, the, the people who I've described here who were attacked were fairly well-known critics of the government. Uh, and I don't think the issue of you know, poor pay or treatment necessarily came into, into play in these cases. Um, while uh, I'm sorry, while the uh, the point of the uh, I mean, I'm trying to understand how much uh, a journalist can uh, um, uh, make his job in a in um, can have a certain degree of independency of uh, when. Uh, most of the mainstream media uh, belongs to large group, large uh, corporations, uh, where to have an independent media itself is uh, requires uh, financing, and this is very difficult to achieve. So I'm trying to understand, uh, beside all uh, what we have heard about the responsibilities of the, I mean the the. Uh, the responsibilities of the government and the army and the power, uh, uh, trying to understand uh, what are the conditions of work for journalists, uh, beside the well-known, the, 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 the senior editors. So uh, um, uh, ownership of the media, financing for independent media, for instance, electronic independent media, uh, and the condition of uh, work for for the journalist but, uh, so thank you yeah, I mean I, I think just Sh Sri Lanka in in that sense is not necessarily different from what's taking place across the world which is that uh, you know print journalism um, is not as sustainable as it once was the, the new models for uh, independent online, principally online journalism, are still being created. There are success, certainly success stories, um, and uh, y you know you could say Lanky e News is, is a success story in a sense, but that's an exile media out of London. Um, but, but it is, uh, you know, the, it's frankly it's inspiring when you think about it because the, the, the economic conditions for for journalism and for journalists are becoming more and more difficult, and yet more and more people want to do it. Because there's a there's a thirst to tell the truth, and there's a thirst to know the truth by by people who consume this media. Thank you. Thank you, Eduardo. Thank you. Thanks, Steve, for your testimony. I would like to to ask you if you can elaborate a little bit of something that you said in your written testimony sent to this tribunal. In one paragraph you said, meanwhile, the infrastructure of achieving justice for past human rights violation has collapsed. And then you say investigation, investigators fled the country. Could you please elaborate a little bit of that? Why you're saying that the judiciary system collapsed and uh, impunity is the rule and not the exception. Thank you. Well, I think we, we saw the, you know, the green shoots of and during the, uh, after the, the, the 2015 election, the, you know, the, the CID, the Criminal Investigation Division, was pursuing some of these cases. And um, they were arresting people uh, and they were put out on bail. So you had the beginnings of a serious um, uh, investigative effort. Um, but it never really got past that beginning, beginning stage. Uh, and after the, uh, the 
2019 elections. Um, I think we're going to learn more about this tomorrow um, in, in, in some of the testimony. So maybe I should leave it to them, but it is that those investigative efforts appear to have collapsed. Uh, and the, uh, it, it, it is, uh, you know, there's been no further progress in any, in any of the cases as far as I'm, I'm, I'm aware. Yeah. So I have two questions based on what you said just now. One is, I know you said that it doesn't require many cases to be filed against journalists for the message to get out. But do we have any data of actually how many journalists have been charged under the uh, PTA, under the Public Safety Ordinance? And I'm presuming that both these are non-bailable? I, I don't know. So that's what I'm asking. Yeah. That's one question. And the other one, again, about censorship. Um, you said that uh, the Tamil uh, newspapers and media houses often get these uh, questions asked after something is published. But you mentioned that uh, Iqbal, uh, Iqbal Athas, yeah. Athas, his articles were prevented from being published. So I, I wasn't able to understand. Does that mean? There, there was a formal censorship regime put into place in the early 2000s. Okay. And so a lot of the newspapers appeared with, with, um, you know, with copy blanked out. Um, it was a formal regime. There was a censor in the newspaper office who had to approve all the copy. This took place. This, uh, this, uh, you know, persisted for a few years. While the, while the war was on. Yes. Yeah. And on the P PSA and. Uh, you know, there are relatively few. Um, as far as I know, there are relatively few journalists actually charged on, on, under these acts. Or in or in jail, are there any journalists in jail under any of these? Um, well, there's, there was this one case that I mentioned um, of uh, a journalist who was in jail for eight months. Um, at, it was a Sinhala journalist, actually, a former mili military officer who turned to journalism, and he was, he was kind of a thorn in the side of the government. And so they, they brought these charges against him um, and held him in, um, held him in, in jail for, for eight months, um, preventive detention. Um, and... Uh, and then, you know, they, his case was he had heard that there was a potential for attack on the um, Indian embassy. And he reported that to the embassy. The, an officer at the embassy phoned the Sri Lankan security services, uh, which went to the journalist and said, well, why didn't you tell us? Um, and, you know, that, that with this, in, this intelligence. And so they, they arrested him and put him in jail, which is it's, it's, it's pretty nonsensical. Um, right. That was that was that particular case, but these you know the uh, these cases of interrogating the the Tamil journalists, which we have documented on, and we documented on our website. Um, you know, this is a, there, uh, there's a very clear threat to put these people in jail, and I mean they 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 were interrogated because they covered demonstrations, for example, or they um, they, they this one journalist there was a um, a um, Commemoration for for uh, Tamils who were killed in the sinking of a of a ferry, and this was considered to be a controversial thing, and, and so the police were upset about it. So they picked him up and interrogated him. But I mean, that that gives a sense for the kind of uh, you know constricted environment in, in which Tamil journalists continue to operate. Then, and it's I I I agree with the statement this morning that. That this is a lot of this is underreported. Frankly, it becomes a routine part of life. You know, if you, you know, when these things first occur, you may think, "Well, this is newsworthy, and we're going to report it." But after a while, if you keep getting these phone calls and you keep getting these kind of interrogations, after a while, it becomes kind of a routine fact of life, um, and and it just prevents any kind of meaningful news coverage. Thank you. Uh, I don't know if I understand well. You said that is uh, Tamil journalists many times are killed by Tamil extremists, not by not by government. No. Yes, if you look at the if you look at the cases, we we believe that some of them some journalists were were killed by the LTTE, or. I mean, it was a very complicated period. There was a, 
a, you know, a Tamil faction that was allied with the government, which also attacked some journalists. So this is not, strictly speaking, uh, many of the murders were not strict, uh, the direct responsibility of the government. However, as far as I'm aware, there hasn't been a single arrest associated with any of the murders of, of Tamil journalists. In all of these cases where we're talking about um, you know, investigations and arrests, it all has to do with the Sinhala community. So this, this, and I think this is just something that Tamils, they, they live with it. And sorry, and why, why they, do they attack journalists? What? Because Tamil journalists also were critical of of the Tamil separatists. I mean, they were, they were, they were doing their job as journalists and, and re reporting what was going on. I mean, it, it was, a, the Civil War was a terrible, complicated um, and brutal period in, in Sri Lankan history. And another question, uh, the CID? Yes. Uh, yeah. It's because uh, I, I read about that they did an investigation first in the cases and in the La Santa case and others, but there are really, there were really independent, uh, like I am Mexican and I know that <laughs> if you have everything failed, also the prosecutors and investigators and police failed. So for me it was like kind of strange that some part uh, it, does does well, so. Well, you know, I think this is the way I look at it. I mean, I don't have the detailed in, in for, detailed knowledge of the inside workings of these institutions. Institutions can be corrupt. Corrupt institutions can uh, can employ individuals who are not corrupt, uh, individuals who are still idealistic. So it's it's perfectly reasonable to me to think that there are people in these organizations who actually want to carry out justice. Um, and they're, you know, the, the heads of the organizations, they, they might tolerate this for a while, even if they have, you know, political pressures not to allow it to go forward. I mean, it's a, it's a game of, uh, of, of creating appearances, particularly, you know, after, uh, after the 2015 election, the international human rights community really breathed a sigh of relief that the old regime appeared to be out of power. Now, of course, that wasn't really true because you had people from the defense ministry who were accused of organizing the attacks against journalists who were actually still in power, not, not the leaders, of the, not the leaders. Um, but it wasn't a clean break with the past by any means. And so, um, but the, I mean, I, I was, I was at, at that conference in uh, the, as the UNESCO conference, I think it was late, you know, 2017. And, there was a sense so Sri Lanka is a good news story. Sri Lanka is, is going through you know these reforms, and um, there was a presentation that was made about the progress that was uh, of these various murder cases, um, and basically it came. And in the end of the day, it came to nothing. The only the only killing of a journalist that was actually solved was that of a, was a journalist who was killed in a mass bombing, where he was not he was not the target. Um, it was, a, but he just happened to, to be there. Uh, yes, I wanted to uh, ask if you would say a little more about um, the uh, t period in which the uh, the new government uh, withdrew from the UN Human Rights Resolutions, and I think in your written statement you said that they expressed a promise to pardon the military who were in jail. And was that an explicit uh, statement? Could you say a little more about that? Uh, yes, uh, the, the President Roger Pox, he didn't, he wasn't part, there was no one in jail at the time, but he was, he was going to clear the records of, um, of military personnel who were accused of committing atrocities in the context of the Civil War. I'm, I haven't, I'm not clear how far that has progressed. I gather a, a, a commission of some sort was set up, and, but I'm not certain how far that has progressed. Yes, Gil, you had another question? Um, yeah, um, it's rather long, but uh, and it's kind of a statement and a question. 
um, and it's about methodology. Um, I want to thank you, Stephen, for your testimony, but also for the work that you and the CPJ <clears throat> are doing. Uh, it's important. Somebody needs to do it, and you're doing it well. I, uh, just as a preface, I've been doing research in the Philippines for many years um, on the killing of lawyers and on the killing of journalists more, more recently, of which there are plenty. And I have discussions with, uh, we have a monitoring group of the International Association of People's Lawyers. And I have discussions with other monitoring groups um, about one thing in particular, many things, but one in particular I want to raise with you and, and just explore it a little bit. And that is, you talked about um, the, the, the killing of journalists that are related to their work. Now, I, I, I actually had some difficulty with that, uh, and I'll, I'll try to explain why. First, uh, as we know, the, there, there are a few really comprehensive um, investigations, all sorts of problems there, but, but we, as a result, we don't actually know um, or have the evidence uh, to tell us whether it was related to their work. We can only assume from the circumstances, I guess. And I, I don't even know what related to their work actually means in a, you know, in a fundamental sense. Um, and I think there are some cases that illustrate that related to their work can mean the fact that, well, in, in many of these countries, and certain, certain, well, let, let me put it this way. Some judges in the Philippines are, are killed because they're judges and somebody wants to, to rob their money because they know that judges get well paid. Now, it may be a sexual crime. It may be a land dispute. It may be many things unrelated to their, to their work in one sense, but clearly related to their work because of who they are. The status they have means they have money and therefore they're a target to be robbed. Further, taking it a little bit further, um, and there's a case in Mexico, which I, I find really interesting, which you, you might want to have a look at, and that's Michelle Simon. Um, in, in, uh, in, 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 in countries like Mexico, Sri Lanka, the Philippines, Syria, um, there's a lot of fear out there amongst journalists. Uh, and we've heard all about that and for good reason. It seems to me that in those circumstances, when the news gets out that a journalist has been killed, that feeds the fear. It doesn't, to me, <laughs> it, I, I don't think it matters that much, actually, why the person was killed. After you've had 30, 40, 50, 70, whatever, killed, and there's this, a, a, a state of fear amongst the profession, and they hear, they learn that somebody else has been knocked off, doesn't that have a very negative impact upon them? Um, so, I, you know, I'd just like to hear how you feel about that. It's just a kind of methodological issue, I guess. You know, we feel... We feel that our credibility is boosted if we can produce evidence or facts that a journalist killing was in some way related to their work. Now, sometimes we deliberate this over a long time. Um, we, we're we don't go there automatically when a journalist is killed. Uh, I mean, I, I, we, we have this, um, I'll just I'll use the case of Pakistan. Because so we, a lot of you know, journalists are killed in Pakistan, and the local community, no matter what the reason, no matter what the cause, will immediately add this to their list of, of journalists killed, and we don't, we just don't, uh, you know, do that, you know, so easily. I mean, there was a, there was a case um, 
um, which we were deliberating over now, in which a journalist was murdered uh, by a drug gang, um, but he also was an informer with the police, and so we, so we have him. We, we have him on our website of what we call as an unconfirmed case, meaning we, we can't be certain he was killed. It might have been related to his work, but we can't confirm that. Uh, and that's, what I, that's the difference. When I said 30 journalists have been killed this year and 17, we confirm. It's not by, uh, obviously, a legal standard. Um, it's by our own best judgment of what the facts you know, tell us uh, that a that. Uh, someone was killed, in fact, uh, you know, related to their work. And we, we, we will change that classification if we get more information that shows us one way, one way or the other. But we feel our credibility is on the line um, with this, because we don't, I mean, people can, can get murdered for all kinds of reasons. We had a, another case in Pakistan of a very prominent uh, uh, woman broadcaster from Balochistan um, who was murdered by her husband. And some people said it, she was murdered because she was a journalist. And we said, well, we don't know. We can't, we can't make that you know, conclusion. Um, um, husbands kill their wives for all kinds of different reasons. Uh, I'm sorry to say. Uh, but this is, we, we think this is a very important issue on which uh, we put a lot of our credibility. And it's one of the reasons that our numbers for murdered journalists are often lower than other organizations when they tally them. Does that answer your question? Here. Yes, yes. I, I, I wanted to hear what you had to say. That's fine. I, I don't know if I will... Re, re, well, how many journalists did you consider in Sri Lanka has been killed? related to their professions? I'd have to go back and look at the number. The number that we have for that period, 20, um, 2005 to 2015, is 10 murdered. In other words, specifically killed uh, for their work. Nine of those are Tamil and one of them is, you know, uh, the number of journalists killed. And if you put in media workers, that, that, that is one of the reasons that the number you heard this morning was much higher. Because we don't, although we, we do now, um, we ha uh, keep track of media workers who are killed. Uh, we we don't calculate the numbers in just the same way. So there are a number of journalists. I mean, for example, there was a bombing in in Jaffna uh, during the war, um, where I think uh, I don't think any journalists were killed, but there were the media workers, you know, counting people, sales sales circulation, you know, were killed. So they so they will appear on our site after a certain you know period of time, but we don't count them as as journalists as murdered journalists. And disappear? Do you have uh, disappear, exiled? I don't know, you have yes, we have, we, have, we have that. I, I, I have to look at the numbers on that one. Yeah. Thank you. If the panel is, is done with the questions, I just have one question that I would like to clarify. Just to be clear, it's relevant on impunity. Um, when you talked about credible steps taken to investigate or to inquire about the killing of the of the journalist, was that subject to a particular period or a particular change in government and leadership, or that was throughout? I mean, could we be more specific about those steps taken in the time frame speaking? Uh you mean after the change in government in 2015, there appeared to be... If they were, exactly. If they were associated to that change in government. Yes, and... yes, for sure. Now, I, I can't speak to what might have been going on in the CID prior to that. Now, what um, we were we understood that, that there, I believe that there were investigations taking place, but we're also told after... At, uh, you know, at, after the election, that evidence was destroyed. There was an intentional destruction of some of that evidence, and I, and I, um, you know, the, the the government changed, but the the inspectors of the CID didn't necessarily change. And uh, so there, uh, I I can't tell you the inside history of exactly what was going on. And to your knowledge, after two thousand nineteen, things became like dead again or stole again or was any steps taken yeah as far as i know well there there was there was um 
there were continued some hearings, and in, in, in the case of Pragith, there were there were some continued hearings, but they were delayed for all kinds of reasons. There was COVID, the uh, you know the COVID nineteen uh, pandemic, um, but I think the overall sense is that there wasn't any serious continuing investigation into any of the cases after that. Thank you very much. Uh, that's it from me. Thank you, Steve. Uh, unfortunately, due to unforeseen circumstances, the next witness, Mr. Juan Mendez, is not available to testify to us today. We will therefore take a longer break and reconvene with the testimony of Mrs. Catherine Amarfar at 3.30. Uh, so everybody in the room, I would like to invite to take a break and go outside or uh, use the space here. And on the live stream, we will reconvene at 3.30.
Welcome back at the Sri Lanka case hearing of the People's Tribunal on the murder of journalists. We will now continue with the testimony of Mrs. Catherine Amirfar of the high-level panel of legal experts on media freedom. Mrs. Amirfar will join us online. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Oh, hi. Can you hear us all right? Because I'm having I can hear you. all sorts of problems with the microphone. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for joining us from afar. And the way we're going to proceed, I'm going to ask you a few questions. And of course, there will be time for you to add anything that you would like to, to introduce in addition to, to the questions. And then I will give the, the time to the panel of judges who will love probably follow up with a few questions as well, if that's OK, Ms. Amirfar. Of course. Thank you. Uh, if you don't mind introducing yourself to the panel, so which the questions are a little bit open-ended, but including uh, introducing yourself in your role professionally, but also if you don't mind as a, as a deputy chair of the high-level panel. Of course, and thank you, and good afternoon to everyone, and it's a privilege to be here, and I want to thank the People's Tribunal in particular for the opportunity to address you and to address these critically important questions. So I co-chair the International Dispute Resolution and Public International Law Groups of the international law firm of Deba Boyce and Plimpton. I've worked in the field of public international law for over 20 years with a particular focus in my human rights practice on the protection of media freedoms. And in 2021, I was appointed the deputy chair of the international expert body, the high level panel of legal experts on media freedom. Would you please describe um, your work at the high level panel, perhaps not only your work individually, but the mandate and what the high level panel up of today, and I know there's been um, some growth in, in, in extensions in the mandate, but just what they're doing and what they're aiming at doing, please. Of course, happy to. So the panel is the independent advisory body of the Media Freedom Coalition, which is a coalition of 52 countries that have pledged collectively and individually to fight against restrictive laws, punitive legal measures, physical violence, and other challenges that far too many journalists face today. To quote the founding document of the Media Freedom Coalition, the member countries recognize that, and again, I quote, media freedom is an integral element of global security and prosperity. And people need free media to provide them with accurate information and informed analysis if governments are to be held to account. And I'll end the quote there. The core of the mission is protection of free media as a central pillar of democracy. The panel itself was founded in 2019. It was founded at the request of the UK and Canadian governments and is comprised of 15 leading experts in international law. The mandate is to provide specific legal advice and recommendations to member countries of the coalition on ways that they can promote and protect a vibrant, free, and independent media. The panel's chair is Lord Newberger, the former president of the UK Supreme Court, and I serve as deputy chair of that panel to help advance this critical work. And as I think we've heard throughout the course of the day, the work has never been more urgent. 2021 marked the 15th consecutive year of decline in global freedom, according to Freedom House. And it's a crisis that's global in nature with hundreds of journalists targeted and killed worldwide. In terms of its work, the panel and its members have in various forms produced advisory reports on key media freedom issues, addressed concrete recommendations to individual and collective coalition countries, provided individual countries with legal advice in the form of legal opinions on draft legislation when media freedoms are engaged and issued amici curiae opinions at the request of international and regional courts in landmark media freedom cases. In addition, in the first couple of years of the panel's um, constitution, we produced four advisory reports that recommend a number of actions that we say countries can and should take to improve the protection afforded to media freedoms. And they're in four key areas. I'll be quite brief, but I just wanted to mention those four areas because I think at the core of this, they are implicated by, by the questions and the facts that we've been discussing. 
So the first is the establishment of a system of emergency visas for journalists at risk of arbitrary arrest or targeting or violence in their home countries. The second is the development of a robust system of consular support for journalists facing such persecution. The third is the use of targeted travel and financial sanctions specifically against individuals for abuses against journalists. And finally, and quite centrally um, the topic of focus today, the building of capacity to properly investigate abuses to engage greater accountability, including, and we can speak to it further, the creation of what we've called for as an independent investigative task force. And I must say that in the years that have come since the issuance of these reports, accountability has been a key focus of the panel's work. We've prioritized specifically asking states to develop and promote capacity for accountability, given how important that is, not just for the abuses that have occurred, but in disincentivizing and protecting against abuses that would, could occur and the targeting of rule of law and media organizations. If you allow me, um, before we go into the specific case of Mr. Lasanta, uh, in touching on, on the recommendations that you just mentioned, uh, what is, well, not only what recommendations specifically, but what is the high-level panel um, underst understanding or, or opinion on the state of impunity, part of this tribunal or the focus of this tribunal in these three cases, but frankly around the world is not only analyze what we know is there, and it's a fact, the violence against uh, these professionals and freedom of expression, but also the inability to effectively investigate uh, in their home, in the countries where these events take place, but even beyond, effectively, the, what, what is in, in your, as a member laterally of the high level panel, your opinion, and perhaps recommendations or ideas the high-level panel is, is entertaining us to be more effective? Absolutely, and it's an excellent question. One of the key areas of work identified by the high-level panel from the very outset was accountability. And in fact, the, the, the fourth area that I mentioned, which is the, invest, the accountability and building capacity to investigate abuses has been the core for focus of multiple recommendations and those recommendations, we, just, we wanted to, one, be clear-eyed about the challenges, the current challenges that governments face in achieving accountability when it comes to the targeting and abuse of journalists as an evidentiary matter, as a domestic prosecutions matter. But second, thinking about international or transnational efforts that could allow journalists who are currently under siege in governments where domestic accountability is frankly a dream, not realistic, to be able to access international mechanisms for accountability. So what, what, in that fourth enforcement report, which focuses on effective investigations, we are addressing with individual countries, we're addressing with the co-chairs and the executive group of Media Freedom Coalition, how to bolster domestic accountability regimes in the sense of transparency and reporting out of investigations where there are allegations of of abuse and harassment or even murder of journalists and enhancing the transparency around those facts. And where domestic accountability through court action, through domestic investigations is simply too unrealistic, futile, would not actually get us to justice, accessing regional and international means more easily. Right now there's a huge hurdle and challenge for individual journalists, for organizations to be able to access those international mechanisms. And part of the concrete recommendations of the panel in that effective investigation report is to think about international and regional bodies that can make that more accessible as a mechanism to access justice. Wonderful. Um, in specifically, perhaps we should just go into uh, La Santa case. Would you mind relating, I know you were deeply involved, relating uh, how you came about working that, in that case and investigation? Sure. So we, we serve as co-counsel with the Center for Justice and Accountability, including Mushin uh, Sarak Harati, who you heard from this morning, in representing Ahimsa Vikramatunga in seeking justice for the murder of her father, La Santa. 
And it's been some uh, work that we've undertaken for the last several years, including representing Ahimsa in a civil case before US courts, where we sought remedies on, on uh, behalf of charges relating to extrajudicial killing, crimes against humanity, and torture. Well, I understand that Ms. Sakurati will discuss that case in greater detail tomorrow. I did want to mention that we're also representing Ahimsa, and this goes to looking for mechanisms of accountability above and beyond domestic mechanisms, but representing Ahimsa in a complaint before the Human Rights Committee, alleging that by assassinating Lasanta and failing to investigate his murder, Sri Lanka has violated the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. And I'm happy to, to get further into that. We, we took this case on as part of a, a broader human rights practice in which we serve as counsel to individual journalists specifically, and this goes back to the accountability point, specifically where accessibility to domestic mechanisms are simply just insurmountable. The challenges are insurmountable. So from our perspective, it's very important to be able to reach out to individual journalists who are under stress, under duress, who have been targeted for harassment and abuse and match them up with legal mechanisms that are more international and regional in nature. And as we, we've all heard, La Santa was assassinated, frankly, in retaliation for his reporting on the allegations of corruptions made against Rajapak Paksa, who then was Sri Lanka's Secretary of Defense. And I can think of no higher goal of journalism than to investigate public leaders for violations of the public trust. And his murder, I think, exemplifies the need to hold governments to account for their role in perpetrating violence against journalists. And it's what we've called a culture of impunity that protects the killers, that is unacceptable, not just for the individuals and their families involved, for Los Santa and his family, but for the continued safety of journalists in Sri Lanka, around the world, and for protection of the rule of law. From you, you talk about culture of impunity, and I think it also allows me to, to amplify a little bit the question, if I may. From your experience in human rights, you said that they, with a special focus, um, given the conditions on journalists and freedom of expression, what are the elements, if you could share, in the Las Anthas case that made it, uh, well, made it of, of, uh, of interest in the sense of seeking accountability beyond Sri Lanka? And in the persistence, perhaps, of impunity, what you call, I believe, culture of impunity, if you could relate it around this, the La Santa case, but also in relation to other cases that you could put um, in comparison with this one. Absolutely. Um, so in terms of the culture of impunity, I think what I'm referring to is the political context in which La Santa and others are operating. So as we've heard, Sri Lanka has a long and well-documented history of failing to hold perpetrators of human rights violations accountable for crimes, especially when those allegations involve government officials. And most recently, the Human Rights Council adopted a re resolution, this was last year, that expressly stated serious concern about ongoing impunity, political obstruction for accountability of human rights violations in Sri Lanka, and urging the government to live up to its obligations under international and domestic law. And I think La Santa's murder tragically put center stage and speaks to Sri Lanka's ongoing legacy of impunity. His murder, as you suggested, was just one of a series of attacks against journalists in Sri Lanka since the start of the country's civil war. They've been part of a concerted plan to prevent investigations into war crimes, crimes against humanity, as well as any element of that history of violence. And sensitive to the, any criticism of the war effort, allegations of corruption, the Rajapaksa regime has invoked new national security laws to attack the free press, including routine assaults, arrests, and deportation of journalists. In September 2015, the UN Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights dedicated investigation on Sri Lanka, and that concluded that the Rajapaksa regime appeared, quote, systematic in their repeated targeting of specific media known for being critical of government policies or figures, end quote. So understandably, many journalists in Sri Lanka have fled, many have self-centered, and international press bureaus and independent media outlets 
have been downsized or closed. And this is something that's part and parcel to a global phenomena that, that we're witnessing, which is part of the reason why the work of the panel in advising the Media Freedom Coalition is looking for systemic global solutions. But I have to say there, there are limits to what we can accomplish through legal mechanisms because it does require political will. And Lasanta's case, again, just to go back to your question, really exemplifies why we need a combination of both. So Lasanta was, even after he started getting harassed and persecuted, he was among the, the brave journalists who decided to stay, who decided to stay for love of their country, who decided to stay because the importance of making facts known to everyone to support freedoms was so important to him that he was willing to risk his life. And I think as we've heard, he founded the Sunday Leader in 94. He continued to run an independent newsroom until his murder in 2009. And I, I trust that the tribunal will hear about the remarkable work that he undertook in those 15 years in the face of such unimaginable pressure. He was killed while he was driving to work on 8 January 2009. Three days after he was killed, the Sunday Leader published a posthumous editorial that he left on file in the event of his death. And Ms. Sakurati drew your attention to this letter earlier today, and it goes without saying that it perfectly captures why accountability for his murder is so important. And again, this is not just about Lasanta, but tragically, the pattern of attacks against journalists continued after his murder. Government security forces attacked at least seven other journalists in the remaining years of the Rajapaksa administration, including at least three assaults, two death threats, one disappearance, one shooting, and one deportation. Thank you. And now I'm going to ask you perhaps um, just detouring a little bit, but uh, to wear perhaps two hats at the same time, if you may, as you answer. One, as a, naturally a lawyer who has investigated these cases and who actually went as far as bringing an effort of accountability in conjunction with the Center for Justice and Accountability in the United States, which is pretty far from Sri Lanka, and another perhaps a double hat of being a high-level panel in the efforts that the high-level panel are trying to, uh, is trying to achieve. And what do you think of uh, present time of the impact of these uh, mechanisms or these efforts, just to be more comprehensive. And if I may not to trap you, but what will it be the ideal or expected impact in, to, to achieve as we hopefully move towards more effective steps uh, on accountability? Thank you for the question. I think first and foremost, it's transparency. It's making sure the world appreciates and knows what happened and what happened to La Santa is happening now today, this very minute in Sri Lanka, in other countries, and why it's important for those of us who are devoted to the protection of the rule of law, for countries to acknowledge that we are in crisis, that the independence of the media is part and parcel to a free society that we all endeavor to and that we are in currently in crisis. So the first is to talk about it to, through the efforts of the People's Tribunal, through the commitment of the 52 countries and the Media Freedom Coalition to shed light on what is going on so that these actions, these extrajudicial killings, the harassment, the abuse does not use the cover of night to escape accountability. So that's first is transparency. And second, to think broadly about regional and international mechanisms, because it is so difficult, if not impossible, in certain circumstances, including in Sri Lanka, to achieve domestic accountability. That's just a dream in Sri Lanka. I mean, I, I want to say for a minute that I didn't have the honor of getting to know Lasanta, but I am sure that his daughter, Hinsa, would make him proud. Not only is she a successful journalist in her own right, but she's never stopped fighting for justice for her father's murder. But ultimately, no matter that devotion, no matter the really egregious and documented facts of his targeting and his killing, it was impossible to obtain in Sri Lanka accountability and justice. Rajapaksa himself set the tone for the government's response 
In a 2009 interview that's still up on YouTube, he dismissed Lasanta's killing as, and I quote, just another murder, end quote. And he asked the BBC journalist rhetorically why he was, quote, so worried about one man, end quote. And as, as will be detailed, I believe tomorrow, the government has thwarted every effort to investigate his murder since, doctoring medical records, intimidating witnesses, replacing honest investigators, and making evidence disappear. This is a playbook. It's not a single circumstance, but it goes to show why domestic accountability is so difficult. So from the perspective of the panel's work and these international mechanisms, the Focus Media Freedom Coalition, it is absolutely critical to pursue justice. And as you say, the United States is far afield from Sri Lanka, but we were able to assert facts that made jurisdiction in United States courts for some of these abuses, including his presence in the United States as a basis for the domestic litigation. Equally went before the Human Rights Committee. And again, part of this access to accountability and the mechanisms is to make these facts known so that there can be the hope of justice, even if currently in Sri Lanka, it cannot come from the Sri Lankan government. And I'll, I'll just note today that there's lots of challenges in domestic courts as well. Uh, the U.S. case actually was dismissed on, on the basis of head of state immunity when Rajapaksa was elected president. And so that case automatically had to be dismissed. But the Human Rights <coughs> Committee complaint continues. So again, another reason why the international mechanisms are so important and another reason why the high level panel working in conjunction with the Media Freedom Coalition is so focused on accountability and effective mechanisms for investigation. Thank you very much. I don't have any more questions. So if the panel, perhaps. Thank you, Catherine, for your testimony. It's a f question regarding what you just said. You mentioned that because of the situation at the domestic jurisdiction, and I'm quoting you, it's important to go to regional or international mechanisms. I know international mechanisms for Sri Lanka, but what regional mechanisms you were thinking? If you're thinking a specific regional mechanism for, for Sri Lanka, and do you know that the case or other cases are ongoing there? Thank you. Thank you very much for the question. I was referring to uh, regional human rights mechanisms. So the Inter-American Commission, Inter-American Court, African Commission, African Court, uh, where we have seen examples of media freedom challenges that have come up, not in the context of Sri Lanka, but more broadly. Um, so when I was thinking of, when I mentioned regional mechanisms, it's those kinds of human rights bodies where you can manifest, for example, violations of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, you can think about it in the, the context of universal freedoms around liberty and security of the person, freedom from torture, rights of free expression, expression, access to effective remedy. These are all, these kinds of rights are manifest, not just in the universal rights charters and the ICCPR is obviously paramount, but also in the regional charters. So that's what I was referencing in terms of access to justice in those regional mechanisms. May I? Uh, Helen, a follow-up question. I totally agree with you, and I think that the problem in Sri Lanka is much worse because there is no original mechanisms. You know, uh, Sri Lanka is not under the jurisdiction of the inter-American system or the African system or the European system. And unfortunately, for Southeastern uh, Asia and from other regions of the world, you know, civil society was pushing for having regional mechanisms, but there is not a regional mechanism for Sri Lanka. So if there is no, you know, justice at the domestic level and the UN level is doing some work, and I think you were involved in that, the problem is that we don't have a regional mechanism and other re mechanisms to, to get justice. But it was just for my clarification. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, um, I have, this is very interesting, but uh, forgive me, I don't want to sound cynical, but I'm really trying to understand. So the 52 
countries who you say are members of the Media Freedom Coalition, are they representatives of the government or are they civil society representatives? Who are they? I couldn't quite understand. And secondly, do you have even one instance of where this kind of international pressure um, on a country, on a state, has actually led to some concrete change in terms of, uh, you know, um, uh, dismantling structures that are um, uh, restricting a free media. Because, you know, I'm, I, I'm a journalist, so I'm trying to put my head around this. So, yeah. you know, we can, we can appeal to international mechanisms, but do they really work in states, not just Sri Lanka, but, you know, many other countries? That's why I want to know if there is one instance. And please just explain to me at least this 52 members who they are. Sure, absolutely. And you don't sound cynical. You ask all the questions we should constantly be asking ourselves about whether something is working. So the Media Freedom Coalition is a coalition of the countries themselves. So it's the governments who have committed to be part of this coalition, who have committed to a mandate and a charter, who have committed and put together our body, the high level panel of legal experts to advise them as an independent advisory body. So at the, for example, this year's ministerial was held in Tallinn, Estonia. I had the privilege of being there and representing the panel. And members, um, high level delegations of the 52, most of the 52 countries, actually, it was an extraordinary level of participation, went to Palin, Tallinn, excuse me, to report out on their progress, on especially their progress with respect to the various the four subject matter areas in which I've, I've mentioned that we have concrete recommendations by the panel itself. And so Talon was an opportunity to take stock. That is a direct participatory framework for the countries themselves to come to the table and say, this is a priority. We are in crisis. This is what we're willing to do. And it's the combination of the political will and the legal means that I mentioned that's so important. You have to join the two. So the UK and Canada were the initial, initial co-chairs. It's now the UK and the Netherlands. And I will say, and this included in Tallinn, each state reported out on its progress to date. And there is plenty of reason to keep pushing, to your point, is this actually effective? Are states doing things? There's plenty of reason to keep pushing because I think the states themselves, including because of the pandemic and various things that have slowed down efforts across the board and diplomatic efforts across the board, aren't doing enough currently. But we also saw where we got traction on some of the concrete recommendations. So this goes to the second part of your question. Is it making a difference? So for example, Canada was one of the first countries to commit to a very specific emergency visa that journalists could take advantage of when they are in danger in their home countries. That was a marvelous and very concrete first step. And we were very happy to see, while we don't have yet a critical mass of countries who are willing to, to make this political commitment, we do have pending legislation in the Netherlands. We do have the ability to see in the statements of other countries that this is getting traction. That's just one example. The other place that where I think that we're seeing some concerted efforts is around legislation, or let me put it this way, the misuse of, for example, criminal defamation um, statutes. As I mentioned, part of what the panel does is to give advice on draft legislation or legislation that's currently in force um, that, is, uh, that is being misused to target journalists. So we see that in two areas. One is criminal defamation, the other is, is terrorism and anti-terrorism statutes. La, La Santa's case, exemplifies why misuse of anti-terrorism statutes is so effectively used against and to on attacks of media. But on the criminal defamation, for example, that's also used to go after media, um, members of the media for the content of their speech. And it's used by governments across the world. There, I can say in the Inter-American Court, the panel was able to put in an amicus curiae brief that explained why the misapplication and misuse of criminal defamation was so dangerous to media freedom uh, and to independent voices uh, across the board and frankly, the rule of law to good effect. So I would say, I don't think that you're being cynical. I think countries should be put on, on notice 
that they need to take concrete actions. We are way past the time of just words and that they will be measured by those concrete actions. And on, in Estonia, that was the tone of, of what it meant to be part of the Media Freedom Coalition. They actually had to show concrete actions. The only other thing I'll say is that part of the panel's remit is to engage in bilaterals with each and every member, each and every of the 52 members. It's gonna take us a while to get through all 52, but we're starting with the executive group in which we ask for exactly what you're suggesting. What have you done here? What have you done here? What more can you be doing here? So I, again, I, I really appreciate the question. I think we should be cynical until we see results, but there's very good reason to push and the Media Freedom Coalition is important in the sense that these 52 countries have committed to prioritizing this question and these issues. So just, just a small follow-up. So uh, yeah. I, I'm presuming that the three countries that we have we are addressing, Syria, Sri Lanka, um, and Mexico are not part of this coalition, am I right? Or is any one of them part of it? Um, Mexico, I believe, is Mexico part of it. And, okay. yeah, the, the other two are not. And the one point I should mention is when, you, when we talk about the effects of the Media Freedom Coalition, there's obviously the direct participation of member states, but the 52 states. I cannot say enough, though, about the domino effect of these 52 states serving as a paradigm of the political will and the legal mechanisms to actually address these issues effectively. So for example, if we set up what we've asked for, which is a international accountability mechanism to assure invested and effective investigations, it's like the mechanism for the Syria conflict where the purpose of it is internationally to be a repository of competent evidence. And you can imagine how useful that would have been in Lasanta's case for accountability, both domestic and internationally. So it is about also serving as an example to states that are not part of the coalition. Marina, yes. Yes. Um, Thank you. Uh, it's just a follow-up question of, on the follow-up question of my colleague. Um, you said, for instance, Mexico is part of the coalition. In the case of Mexico or in any other case, when uh, one country who's, who is a member of the coalition, so who, who uh, uh, is supposed to um, be uh, committed to protect the freedom of the media, etc. In a case of a country, do not comply or is, uh, is problematic. Do the coalition has um, ever uh, took actions? I, I, I imagine there are no enforcing action, but action like recommendation or raising the alarm somehow. Yes, and, and that's through, um, as you anticipate, it's it's largely through the good work of the co-chairs and the member states, which are in the executive group, where they use their bilateral and multilateral mechanisms in order to leverage compliance. And by the way, I should mention that it's not automatic that membership in the Media Freedom Coalition continues. If there are certain countries that are recalcitrant or not delivering or kind of violating basic norms of the Media Freedom Coalition, it stands to reason that they would fall out of the coalition themselves. So the mechanisms of enforcement are largely diplomatic, but it's also the benefits of being members of the Media Freedom Coalition. And I should just take this moment to, to correct myself on Mexico. Mexico is not a part of the Media Freedom Coalition. My apologies for that. I just double checked and it's not a part. Thank you. And uh, sorry, has it ever happened that the country was uh, left out or was invited not to be part anymore of the coalition? Not yet, but as these things go, it's a fairly young coalition. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I think it largely depends on the direction that the co-chairs, uh, the Netherlands and Canada, choose to take it. So I can't really say where it's going, but I do know that those co-chairs are very committed to seeing action, not just words from these member states. Thank you. Thank you. My 
escena. O sea, um, thank you. Uh, did you me do you mention these uh, like um, recommendations? And is, if I am clear, the system of emergency visas for risks, no? Counseling support that is like psychological or what is that? I don't know, or legal. And the others target travel and money of people and build capacity to investigate. And I will, yes, I would like to know more about how, yes, uh, how do you think this will work or this will be implemented uh, in the countries and how this can help to save lives and to and to allow journalists to do their work? Yes, um, thank you for the, the question. I'll just clarify one thing. So it's not counselor services, but consular services. So it's consistent with um, the Vienna Convention on um, Consular Assistance, where consulates sitting in different countries should be there to support their nationals. That includes in get obtaining lawyers if they've been subject to arrest without uh, counsel and other support services for nationals of their consulates. So that, that's the consular services piece. But going back to your broader question, with respect to these four areas, these reports, these four reports, um, and they're on the Media Freedom Coalition website, and I encourage everyone to take a look, but they run across hundreds of pages of documenting why, when it comes to emergency visas, when it comes to consular services, the current use of sanctions and investigative support, why there are systematic challenges that taken together and individually have resulted in impunity and lack of accountability when media workers are targeted. So these hundreds of pages of analysis are accompanied by very concrete recommendations in each of those four areas. And when I say that the high level panels work currently is focused on enforcement, it's literally reading, going through the list of the concrete recommendations in each of these four areas and engaging countries bilaterally and in multilateral regional groups as appropriate to, to say, have you done this? Have you done that? And one really easy concrete example is that we ask countries to just commit to 50, 50 emergency visas to save the lives of lawyers, excuse me, of, of reporters when they're in danger. Can you commit to 50? That is actually a very, it's a difficult political ask to ask for emergency visas, but we made it and we have more and more countries, three um, so far and more coming that are committed to specific emergency visas or using programs like the United States humanitarian parole programs specifically to address the risk of harm to journalists. So the good news is I think that states, these countries in the coalition and even outside the coalition are taking steps in these four areas as a priority. And we identified these are the four areas that we need to focus on. I haven't mentioned in the second phase of work, we are focused on the cyber targeting of journalists. I think that's going beyond the scope of today, but the use of cyber tools like Pegasus to infiltrate the phones of journalists to target them is an egregious, egregious abuse of power. And unfortunately it's happening more and more and more uh, these days. So we're also focused on cyber um, targeting of journalists. The short of it is, I think that there's political will. There's certainly dozens of recommendations the panel has put forward and there's a current engagement process. And I think that progress is being made, not at the rate that I would want it to be made, but progress is being made in these, in these areas. Um. Another, I want to know more about this capacity, building capacity to investigate. Like, uh, I don't know if in these recommendations you have like really, really specific how a crime of a journalist has to be investigated, have to be investigated. And about the other thing that you mentioned of emergency visas 
I don't know, the countries that are helping journalists and gives visa, they help journalists to continue uh, working as journalists in the new country, uh, continue investigating what they were investigating in the countries that they have to leave? Yes, thank you. I'll take the second question first. The short answer is yes. The idea of these emergency visas is not just to get them and frankly their family members because you can target a journalist not just by targeting them directly, but targeting their family as a means of coercion. So the idea is to get them out of the um, dangerous circumstances that they are in in order not just to save their lives, but to facilitate their work going forward. A lot of these journalists, as we have heard, are brave beyond belief. And what they need is help to continue their work. And so that is a big focus on the safe refuge and the visa recommendations. On the um, investigative uh, aspect of it, so there, there are several concrete recommendations that, that we have. I think in the time that we have, the one I'll focus on is the multilateral investigative task force. This was frankly modeled very much like the mechanism for Syria and, and preserving evidence, with the idea being to bring international best practice in terms of effective evidence preservation, effective investigative approaches, and concretely how to establish and overcome the political and logistical obstacles that it takes to be able to, to, have a, to launch a case of this, of this magnitude. Just to give you a sense for Lasanta's um, case, to bring that case into US courts, to bring it before the Human Rights Committee, took hundreds and hundreds of hours of investigative work in order to determine, for example, how we could link Lasanta's uh, murder to the government in particular, but also in the brief, the legal briefing and all of the aspects that are so important in actually bringing a case to justice. So one of the first steps though is the investigative accountability by having a neutral body that could be charged with preserving evidence, especially when you have the evidence destruction or witness intimidation measures that I mentioned in Lasanta's case, is critically important to be able to ultimately get accountability outside of the domestic. So that's, I'd say, one of the most important aspects of the effective mechanisms recommendations is to have this multilateral international body that is dedicated to preserving evidence and facilitating accountability through legal means. Uh, I'd like to ask about uh, <clears throat> this multilateral uh, body that you're proposing. Uh, under whose auspices? It would be, we've recommended that um, a number of the media freedom countries agree to undertake multilateral negotiations and agree to the mechanism, a mechanism of this nature. So we um, specifically have baked it into concrete asks of certain members if they would take leadership. All of those discussions are ongoing and I can't say yet whether um, we will get enough states to sign up to it, but it's directed specifically at the Media Freedom Coalition countries. Any other question from across the sea? No? Okay, there are no more questions. Just thank you very much for participating in the People's Tribunal today, and, and I think we'll let you go. Thank you very much. It's been a privilege. Thank you, everyone. I think with the... Perfect. I think I'm going to proceed with the permission of the panel of judges to do my closing for the day. We came to an end. This was the last uh, witness testimony of the first session of the Sri Lanka hearings. And, well, I think it's been a very important um, a very important day to really go into depth of what is happening with the remains, unfortunately, is not something from the past. It's very much something that is, um, as one of our witnesses mentioned, it recycles and keeps happening to journalists, the repression against journalists and freedom of expression. We have heard how, um, fortunately, 
the in Sri Lanka, the cycle of violence hasn't ended quite the opposite. It has been re-established with all the consequences that we know of that are going to to be or to mean for, for the, the subject and for the the, um, the priority of this tribunal. Mr. Pakaswati this morning talked about this easy thing that is to kill journalists, that it was actually confirmed later by the testimony of Mr. Bashana. How the past and the future, and I found that extremely eloquent from the prosecution, how the past and the future are united by this permanent lack of accountability in, or impunity, which is the other side of the same coin, perhaps, and how a killing journalists is, is very much part of you know, committing war crimes, discriminating populations, and all of that remaining always uninvestigated, unpunished, and very much in, I'm gonna put myself a little bit far away from, very much in the context of that 90% or plus impunity that we, we talk and that we heard about. We also talk about how the, the same people and the recurrence of people seizing power, remaining in power, and using power to pursue their agendas is a problem that perhaps not unique to Sri Lanka, but very relevant in the analysis of, of a country and the suffering of a country through the repression of its citizens, and in this case, their journalists, how the Rajapaksa family, uh, even though we only have identified two individuals, have uh, seized power and have made of achieving power, concentrating power and retaining power, perhaps the ethos of their, of their ruling, which no question uh, contributes to impunity. But then we also listen uh, to Mr. Butler, who said that despite of the danger just to close always on a positive note within the, the tragedy, uh, there is still people that want to be a journalist. There are people doing this work despite of the risks and the, and the prices who have thirst to show the truth or to tell the truth. And all of us who are still showing very much thirst to know the truth. So we, um, well, what you know is, is we don't have a solution. We just heard from um, Ms. I'm afraid I'm killing some of the last names, I apologize. How then, what is the response? The response is to be more effective and is to go back to accountability. Perhaps accountability is a big word and in that I have um, some experience and some, and some strong opinions, but I do believe uh, that it is the key. And I think that today's sessions um, in this tribunal very much contributes to changing a little bit the cycle. We will be resolving everything? No. Will the framework of accountability resolve again all the problems structural, as Mr. Bashana mentioned, they go deeper in history, atavistic, you know, misperceptions? No. But I think that the accountability will provide for a very objective and honest and perhaps effective antidote to impunity. Impunity that is so um, rooted and is so deep as we will see tomorrow during the, the hearing. They will focus on the case of Mr. Lasantha Wurkeman Tunge and how his impunity they started naturally in the place where he was killed in Sri Lanka in 2009 but then affected colleagues and friends who were working with him and also were attacked and suffered as a consequence but also went beyond and showed that which I actually I remember, if I came on a more personal note, being absolutely shocked by something that um, Ms. Catherine just mentioned. It is how a case, the colleagues of mine and people that I knew put together in the United States can be dismissed on head of state immunity. I mean, it's, a, it's an impunity and a, you don't need to be a lawyer to feel how deeply impunity can go when at the end of the journey, not at the end of the journey, when well, the beginning actually of the journey, but after so many steps and so many efforts, then you get a dismissal on a technicality and the consideration of a person with blood in his hands, immune uh, to, to liability or to responsibility. So we will hear tomorrow in detail about the facts around 
uh, the killing and and also we will hear you know in some testimony around the um, the account the efforts uh, the steps taken in Sri Lanka to investigate the the case when they were happening and of course we will hear at length about the international efforts uh, that they were taking in this particular case that we have mentioned here. Uh, I will apologize to the panel and to everyone that I won't be here tomorrow, but you are in great hands with my colleague, and I will be uh, truly in the Syria hearings next week. I will leave it like that, looking forward to a very important day tomorrow, and thank you all very much for your time. And Mr. Gianni? Uh, yes. <clears throat> By definition, I don't think that uh, uh, as a secretariat we are not uh, drawing any conclusion for a uh, day which is uh, just uh, the beginning of the hearings of the second session of the Tribunal on a Problem for Journalists. I have uh, simply and most sincerely, uh, first of all, thanks uh, the organizer for the perfect organization beside the difficulty we had technically and for the presence. But I think that uh, is uh, important to show how a difficult uh, problem we had to face, uh, the presentation of different scenario in one session for a journalist is giving uh, rise to many uh, reflection and looking forward uh, thought uh, because uh, the field of the killing of a journalist uh, which uh, on the paper were looking backwards for things which are been happening years back uh, is in fact uh, dealing with uh, very very actual problems uh, and uh, I think that all the questions were really pointing to something which is absolutely present, though the cases, both uh, before in Mexico, here, are uh, in fact dated years back. But uh, on one side, for what is happening in Sri Lanka, the problem are completely present, even more present today, and the situation is becoming more complex. And in that sense, uh, is uh, very important uh, to identify now what could be the role of these hearings that is not simply to make uh, responsible people accountable for the past for the past but to look for those who are at present uh, uh, working in the field and internationally how is it possible to look for something which uh, is uh, recognized by everybody as uh, absolutely central such impunity but which is apparently impossible to change now i think that that is the big challenge uh, of the situation to document uh, very very carefully and dramatically that something is happening for which uh, the international present law is not able to propose an answer and to look for the interest or the necessity of change of international criminal law, looking for falsity prevention, changes of structure. Many words which have been said today are really the challenge for the tribunal. Tomorrow we shall face more directly the central case of this hearing, but the idea of the structural characteristics of the assassination, of the killing of journalists is becoming more and more clear. And with that, the idea that we have to face uh, with uh, what optimism, pessimism, realistic attitude, I think that is what we are looking for also for tomorrow. I thank for these uh, hearings uh, and let's uh, work together tomorrow. Thanks. murder of journalists. We will resume the live stream tomorrow morning at 9 a.m.